again, everybody, and welcome to another thrill-packed edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. It's a week before Halloween, and I'm already scared I'm going to have to watch as much wrestling next week as I did this week. We're going to talk about all of that today, a special interview with Tony Geezy from Heritage Auctions, and so much more. And to join me, my co-host and cohort, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's the scariest man in podcasting, the great Boris Last, everyone. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. I guess it's better it's than so being sp- Lugosi last. It's so spooky. It's so spooky this time of year. <laughs> See? All right. Watch out, ma'am. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> What are we doing here again? I, we tried to get back on our regular release schedule this week, and and I think we've given up on that at this point. But you you had the the product launch uh, a few months ago. They've changed the schedules on all the TV programs we usually watch. I've had things going on, so you know. But we're, but we're here with the timeliest information we can give here today. That's right. We're uh, re- recording this bright and early, so we're tired and cranky. Yeah. Bright and early, tired and cranky. Um, I do want to mention uh, thank you to everybody who uh, sent well wishes and and thoughts and emails and stuff on uh, on the new contact form at jimcornette.com. I'm getting a bunch of emails. But I mentioned last week on the program that uh, Stacy's mother was going to have heart surgery out in California. This this It was actually this past Friday now as this is released. Well, they postponed it because in one of the uh tests that they did to prep for that surgery they found another issue and to deal with that issue that they were surprised about they have dropped back and have postponed it for about what is that, two weeks and then they're going to do a combination thing where they take care of all those issues at the same time so that's i didn't want to leave everybody hanging with like since so many people have written and said something about it with well what happened well, nothing happened yet. It's going to in the future. So we'll keep you posted on that. But thank you to everybody who, you know, emailed or said something about it. And also, and Brian, you saw this, um, best wishes to Jim Ross. He tweeted a picture of his ankle that he's been, I guess he said, is having an issue with for the past year or so. And it did not look good. Um, and he said it's a possible issue with skin cancer and he's getting it addressed. So we just want to say best wishes and good luck there because that was not, you didn't want to be eating your morning magic spoon and see that picture, Brian. No, I don't think anyone wanted to see that picture. I don't know why that picture was posted to be quite honest with you. I'm not sure. I believe I might've told some people about it, relayed the information. I'm not sure they needed the visual backup, but anyway, but JR feel better. And also... We've gotten a ton of people. Apparently, there is a Swedish rapper named or was now named Einar. And he got shot or killed or in some fashion, he's no longer with us. And we got a bunch of people asking, was this our Einar? We do not think it's our Einar, but we're reaching out to the the one who's sent in so many great song submissions on uh, on the drive through on our song contest and etc but we were we're reaching out to him to make sure if he answers this i guess that that'll settle that but uh is einar a common name in the scandinavian countries maybe that can explain this i'm going to assume so but i don't know for sure i will say i tried to figure out because we did hear from a lot of concerned listeners yesterday asking if this was einar and it was the first i had heard of this news i don't follow the scandinavian music scene too closely anymore what? Any, oh, anymore. Okay, well, you don't have time now with the kids. That's right. You were and right on top of You had your finger right inside the uh, Swedish music scene before. But I have seen some videos of our Einar playing some songs on guitar, not rapping the songs, but singing them while he plays them. He has a wonderful voice. I don't believe it is the rapper Einar, but we can't completely shut this down until we hear something back but it, i don't it, think it, it's him it would be unusual that there would be, we've never heard the name einar before but maybe it's common over there but then two musical geniuses apparently this big uh, well I, he's a rapper so maybe i don't i haven't heard any of that but our einar wasn't rapping he as you mentioned had a very 
mellifluous voice. Wouldn't it be so, something if the biggest rapper in Sweden, when he wasn't rapping, he was sending in songs for a <laughs> podcast <laughs> about wrestling? <laughs> well, but then again, look at our audience. I mean, the biggest rapper in Sweden, is that like being the nicest guy in prison? Is that a... Is that a status that everyone aspires to? We'll find out. Anyway, we just wanted to throw that out there, folks. There was a, a ridiculous amount of feedback of concern to us. Like, is this our Einar? And we we don't think so, but we're trying to narrow it down. Um, Speaking of narrowing things down, the merchandise update at jimcornet.com. As we speak, over 500 of the nearly 2,000 orders that were placed have already been shipped and another 300 minimum uh depend on how busy i can get the next couple of days another 300 minimum will be going out this week by the end of the week friday the 29th so that'll make 800 another 11 something to go but we're we're making great progress and people are starting to see their packages pop up in their various postal boxes and slots and it's always nice when you have something pop up in your slot Hello. I'm letting you uh, sit with that one. As I was, I'm sitting with it now. Uh, I've got an update on another thing that we talked about on the program here recently. I can't remember which program it was, but when we were talking about the CWA World Championship that Jerry Jarrett created in Memphis um, with the original attempt to finally give Lawler a, a world championship uh, run because they didn't want people to get tired of the chase without him being productive, but then he got hurt, broke his leg and ended up uh, Billy Robinson had the belt for some period of time. And we were talking about to, you know, since Robinson was internationally known and was one of the great wrestlers to, you know, give it credibility. But then we said, well, after he was, nobody has seen the belt and I couldn't remember. And you know, we we said, uh, we wonder where that belt is. Well, Mark James, who I should have known Mark would know, and actually, I should have known that I knew, because Mark has told me this before and I forgot it, but he was kind enough to remind us. Um, Mark James wrote and said when it was time for Billy Robinson to leave, uh, or in other words, for Jared Jarrett to give Robinson his notice that, okay, you know, Jarrett called Robinson to tell him and Robinson told Jarrett that he wasn't going to drop the belt and he kept it. And I remember hearing that. Well, after some period of time, a day or two or whatever from his initial statement, um, well, I guess it was actually, yeah, that when Jerry told the story, uh, cause Jerry told the story on Facebook in some interview about a year or so, or about a, a 10 years or so ago of how that Robinson said, I ain't dropping it. And I, and he kept the belt. And when Jerry posted that response, Billy Robinson apparently got back with him and apologized to him and said that when his wife that he was married to at the time kicked him out and divorced him, it was in their house and she kept the belt. So that's where it ended, and who knows what happened from there. But basically, Jerry Jared went to give Robinson his notice, asked him to drop the belt back. Robinson didn't want to and kept it. That was 1980. Well, around about 10 years ago, Jarrett told that story. Billy Robinson got back, said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. But by the way, my wife kicked me out and divorced me, and, and she kept the belt. So there you go. Can you imagine like the poor kids in the neighborhood? They're like, who's that lady there? Oh, her husband used to be a wrestler. She has a championship <laughs> belt. Oh, I wonder if I could see it. And then you see it. You're like, oh, it's the ugliest belt I've ever seen. It yeah. looks so cheap. <laughs> That's not a world championship belt. It was unique. It, it was. No, I mean, I dig it for what it is. But compared to the belts today, it compared to the belts then. I mean, it just it yeah, had it was... such a. No one ever replicated that look. <laughs> the stained glass, I think, really set it apart. Um, and also an update on something else we talked about. We were talking about scaffold matches here just, I think, um, just uh, on the past drive-through this past week. We were talking about some of the scaffold matches, and I mentioned that they did them in Louisville because that's where Jared started it, and that they had, you know, they always drew better in Louisville. They finally did them in Memphis in 87 with the Lawler and Idol business, but I forgot 
I was in error. Uh, they did the Coco Ware Bill Dundee scaffold match in 1982 in Memphis also, and they did one in 1983 when Dundee was a heel with Dundee and Dutch Mantell. And that's where fucking Dutch took that whip up there on the scaffold and they were bull whipping each other with the bull whip on top of a scaffold. So that was interesting, but I've, I've neglected to remember those, but it was still kind of the same thing that when the, when they had the, the Dundee Coco Ware match, for example, in Louisville, they drew almost 6,000 people. Um, it always boosted the house in Louisville. It didn't, Really, maybe the the Lawler and Idol one for the time, and, and Lawler and uh, and uh, oh God damn, it's Lawler and Dutch and Idol and Rich. That's who it was. That one boosted the house. The other ones in Memphis never really boosted the house beyond what Memphis was doing normally. I think partially because there wasn't the legend of that big one like there was in Louisville, like we said, that everybody in town claimed that they were there. And it did legitimately fill the building up, and people talked about it for years. They didn't have one of those in Memphis to start the, the trend off. So that's, But there's a clarification there. Are you clarified? Did they do that match in any of the other towns? I mean, if they did the scaffold match in Louisville and Memphis, is there a chance they did it anywhere else? I mean... Um, they probably couldn't get a scaffold into Nashville, but were they running Lexington? What do you mean, Jarrett and Don Green? No, I'm talking about for no, uh, just Coco, anything. Coco and oh, Dundee. No, in uh, they did one in Rupp Arena with, in Lexington with Dundee and Bobby Eaton, and that's where Bobby took the backdrop up there, which was on, on the two foot wide scaffold. Um, they made them four feet for the tag matches because that way you know you could go past people, and it was it was a little bit little bit easier but the uh single matches the there was only one ladder one board on top of the ladder was so you could monkey bar underneath but it was two feet wide and bobby goes like he's going to give dundee a pile driver and dundee stood up under him and bobby took the backdrop on the scaffold i'd never i was, fuck and then that one, I'm going to say, because I took the pictures. I have them somewhere around here in the office, but uh, I was at ringside. I'm going to say that scaffold was probably off the ring somewhere around. They had to use eight-foot sections. So it was somewhere 13, 14 feet off the ring. Um, And Bobby, took the, he didn't take the bump feet first like he did at Starcade because that was so much higher. He actually was hanging on with his hands and his feet underneath the ladder. And when Dundee, you know, stomped the fingers or whatever he did, boom, 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 the climactic point, Bobby just let go and kind of took a fucking backdrop bump off of that one, which was insane. But but the Lex the Lexington ring was a good ring. It had plenty of give. <laughs> it's amazing there weren't more injuries. I mean, other than your knees. Considering the frequency in 84 and again in 86, and then 87, actually, <laughs> the frequency of the scaffold matches, it's amazing that Dennis didn't get seriously hurt or Bobby. And well, because Bobby always landed off kilter in some fashion. He On the Starcade match, he did turn his ankle somewhat. He was limping for a few days. It wasn't a serious injury. But Dennis... Dennis had that goddamn balance and he always knew where he was when he was up in the air somehow taking a bump or a throw or whatever. He, he never landed awkwardly and he somehow, he got his feet under him where he could land at both feet at the same time, boom, and then kind of fling himself backwards where you couldn't really tell that he just landed on his feet. It was, but he landed solid and firm every time. Um, but yeah, it was it was a miracle that somebody didn't fucking slip at some point, you know, and, and lose track of something. Bobby was a high flyer and he had been involved in a previous one, like you said before. So I can understand how he got convinced to do it. How was Dennis talked into that? I mean, do you remember when Dennis was first told he was going to do this? Well, yes, we all were. It was... Uh, you know, that was the blow off for us to leave Louisiana, which we're probably going to talk about later on in the program when we, uh, the stuff we've been discussing when we first got there, what was going on in Mid-South at the time. But, 
Um, yeah, Dundee said, yeah, we're going to have scaffold matches between you and the rock and roll, the big blow-offs. And, you know, everybody rolled their eyes, but at the same time, well, what the fuck? We're not going to say no because look at the year we had had and all those record gates everywhere and the business that the company is doing. We knew that that was going to be almost another last stampede round of checks to what, you know, and, and it was the second biggest gate and the second sellout that year for Houston and the sold out in Oak city and Tulsa. And, you know, so we did, Dennis was, was going to be the last one to say, we don't want to do those because that's what we were there for was to make that record amount of money. So, you know, it, I, the only thing is, I think Dundee realized, especially because we were leaving the territory, they never even intimated, Cornette, you get up there, because we were leaving, and, and Dundee probably knew I would fuck myself up in some fashion. And we had to go somewhere else, so he didn't want to do that. But the reason why I did it in for Crockett, for Dusty, is because we were staying. We weren't leaving. So even though we had to do the job, that wasn't supposed to be our blow off. So Dusty was, if Cornette takes the bump last, the people will forget that the Midnight Express lost and it'll be all on, on that. And that'll be the memorable pop for the thing. And that'll probably even put more heat on them, which it did. But unfortunately, you know, also led to my surgery and et cetera. But so that's, you know, if they had said at that point, uh, Cornette, you got to take that bump, especially since we did 14 of them in Mid-South, every town on the way out, I would have probably have to said, I don't know. Cause just because I've, you know, we were leaving at that point and, and I needed to be able to, to walk to Dallas. Um, but in, in, I was just going to say at Starcade, it was like, this will be the biggest payoff we've ever gotten and the biggest thing we've ever done which it but was both so i'll fucking do it here's a weird question for you you take the bump thanksgiving 86 starcade when did you book the trip to hawaii um what february 87 so you booked it right before you went or was it already booked you know in november oh, when did i book it um, yeah oh god like, how far now, in advance now, see, did you know you're gonna go to hawaii <clears throat> i can remember everything that we did in a wrestling ring 35 years ago, but you're expecting me to remember details about my honeymoon. Oh, that's true. I forgot it was your honeymoon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. I forgot it was your honeymoon. I'm, I, well, I, you know, yes, we had it booked. I can't remember how far in advance, but why, wh what was going to be your question to that? Well, just in terms of the injury that you suffered coming out of the scaffold match and knowing that you ended up needing knee surgery and time off and you ended up needing time off for, what it turns out was your honeymoon. I knew it was one of your trips to Hawaii. I was just wondering how, in terms of scheduling, because you never miss days, you never miss anything. I was wondering how far in advance everything was figured out for time off. Oh, God. Well, um, now that you mention it, yes, I had, I'm sure, told Dusty, because, I mean, he booked a month or six weeks out on paper at that point in time, but if you were going to be gone for a while, you know, he needed as much notice as possible. I... I don't know truthfully when I told him we did figure the trip in advance, but I actually only ended up taking off two weeks uh, as I'm trying. Yeah, it was two weeks almost exactly after the scaffold for the surgery, because the weekend before the Christmas break was not only in Atlanta TV, but also our debut in Chicago at the Rosemont horizon, which did a $150,000 house and, um, it was a, it was a big weekend. So I went back on the road for that Friday, Saturday, Sunday to do one, two, three, probably there are three or four house shows and an Atlanta TV. And I was on crutches and miserable through the airport and miserable in that fucking Rosemont horizon getting in and out of that place. But I wasn't going to, cause we made like four grand in those three days. So I wasn't going to miss that. And then I got a chance to take another 10 days off for the Christmas break. So that was already scheduled uh, as far as the Christmas break. So I I only took two weeks off after the surgery and then had uh, 10 days off 
for my wedding slash honeymoon in February. But that's when I got suspended for fireball uh, for cosmic the fireball, fireball and the cosmic fireball on Ronnie Garvin. Yes. And that was Dusty's reason to get me out of there for the trip. So is that the craziest four or five month period of the Midnight Express for you? The scaffold match, the injury, you're getting ready to go on your honeymoon. Of course, then Dennis leaves right after the fireball angle. Is that the craziest period, you think? That Yeah, that probably would have been uh, uh, right up there in terms of what the fuck is going on here. Um, but yeah, between, between November and March and then Stan would, by the first week of March, Stan was in or second week or whatever. Did Stan think you guys were done with scaffold matches? Like, oh, surely they will never do these again. I could join the team and I'll be safe. Yes. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. So I asked you how they convinced Dennis in 84. Had they convinced, well, how did Dusty explain this or tell this to Stan in 87? Well, no, then it was just, we saw it on the booking sheet. For Starcade, scaffold match, Rock and Roll Express, midnight. And we're like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> and it's if, but here's the thing. What was Stan going to say at that point? I mean, he said this himself. His his last week in Florida was like $300, and his first week for Crockett was like three grand. So it's one of the feature matches at Starcade. What's he going to fucking say? He just, he always figured out a way to try to keep his feet under him and hope for the best. But it, he was not a fan of those things. And then the next year with the Fantastics. Everyone forgets about that. Even I forget about the 88 matches. Because those were just thrown in there because it was like, let's drop the cow for the Great American Bash. That was just the ultimate hot shotting because that's when business had been down. Late 87, early 88 sucked and the TBS sale was imminent. So he was hot shotting uh everything for the summer bashes to get the business up so it would look stronger going into the sale which he did but in the meantime you know some of them <clears throat> most of the 88 bash matches between the midnight and the fantastics were either regular matches or bunkhouse matches with me involved and those were more fun and they could beat me and that's what people wanted to see but there was what four or five scaffold matches including i think in detroit and and we just hated those because the Midnight and the Fantastics match was so good in any other context, with any other stipulation, any other rule, anything except that. Uh, so those were disappointing. Anyway, how did we get started on that? Speaking of disappointing, what else do we have this week on the experience? Well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Will we ever see a scaffold match again, do you think? I hope not. Is there a way with crash pads to make it safe? No, because then if he got, God damn it, <clears throat> a safe scaffold match, that's like a low fat Twinkie. Just don't eat the fucking Twinkie. The whole idea of the scaffold match is not to be safe. If you put crash pads around the ring, people are like, what the fuck? Um, if you put crash pads in the ring, people are like, what the fuck? It, it, just don't do it. Just don't just forget about it. Nobody needs, and see, now these knuckleheads, somebody would get hurt bad because they'd figure something out. And it was only, as we mentioned, it was the luck of fools and crazy people that Vic Grimes wasn't paralyzed in that thing in XPW. Every time you see it, it, it never gets, it's never easy to see that. It's always, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. Yeah, and I mean, that was on purpose. It wasn't an accident. Jack meant to do it, but still, it, it, nobody needs to have those matches. Anyway, um, a couple of brief shout outs to the people. Uh, Rodney from the Cult of Cornette, not Rodney Esty, not Hot Rod, another Rodney. Hey. Um, basically, he had emailed because um, he and his cousin had uh, liked to listen to the shows and, and were big fans of wrestling. And his cousin got diabetes several years ago since he was unemployed. He didn't have insurance to get insulin. Because we live in the United States of America, folks, for those of you around the world, if you don't have insurance, you'll just die quivering in the street in this country. Uh, but anyway, his blood sugar got out of control and his kidneys shut down and et cetera. And the point is, after COVID this year, uh, Rodney's cousin passed away. And he just said that he said we would talk on the phone about wrestling we grew up on. And he got such a tickle on your rants on the current wrestling. And so did I. So thanks for brightening his day with your podcast and and rodney we were sorry for your loss and we appreciate you guys listening 
Uh, and as well, this is this is sad and funny at the same time. But uh, an email from Austin, um, who thanked us for the podcast and the laughs and etc. But li- this, listen to the story that he told. Yesterday, my dad passed away. He was the one to introduce me to wrestling. I wanted to share with you something that my dad did on purpose that I think you'd get a kick out of. My dad changed his ringtone the day before he died to Undertaker's ringtone. And his theme message, maybe that may be his text message, the, the thing that goes off or whatever. But anyway, to Undertaker saying, rest in peace. So after the nurses cleared his belongings after he died, my father's text tone went off and it said, rest in peace. And the nurses, <laughs> the nurses nearly shit themselves. <laughs> in that Undertaker voice, that's incredible. <laughs> so, oh, man. So my aunt... <laughs> had to ask my cousin who said it was a wrestling thing and then i told her it was the undertaker Even after, <laughs> after death my dad joked with me and sent me this little message from beyond the grave so austin we're sorry but thank you for the story um and of uh, an email from rob brian you might perk up at this one take take notice Jim, I'm a huge fan of yours, and I listen to almost every podcast you and Brian put out, but one thing that really fucking bothers me is Brian's complete lack of knowledge of Long Island. Some of the things he says are totally puzzling to me, and I'm not exactly sure where Brian's from, but I'm guessing probably toward Queens or Brooklyn, which if that's the case, he definitely doesn't know what he's talking about. He's made a lot of strange comments, but the one that gets me is him saying the best beaches are on the north shore of Long Island, which is absolutely I, false. Fuck, can I, hold on, let me jump in right now. I wouldn't normally do this. However, he has not said one thing yet that is correct. I'm from Long Beach, not near Queens, on the south shore. I've never put over the north shore. Fuck the north shore. South well, shore. You're calling Rob a liar here? Rob, you're a liar. Have you listened to the show? I don't know where Brian's from. I've said Long Beach 10,000 times, Rob. One one five six one, and, and and what are you now? You going to Code Academy? <laughs> one one five six one 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 five six one. I'm giving the coordinates. <laughs> yeah. Listen to what he goes on further here. Everybody that's a native Long Islander knows the North Shore is extremely rocky, and a lot of the beaches you can't even step foot on without something on your feet because the rocks hurt. He's right. The South Shore, on the other hand, is totally flat. Beautiful. We have beautiful sandy beaches right on the Atlantic Ocean, all down the coast of the South Shore. That's what I said. So he, Brian, got that one completely backwards. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like Rob has got it completely backwards. Well, another thing he said just recently was that Plainview, Long Island is about as close to Suffolk as Suffolk. 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 Suffolk it. Suffolk as you can get, <laughs> and it isn't as nice as Long Beach and some other places, but Plainview is not as close to Suffolk as you can get. It's probably at least a half hour drive to Suffolk County, maybe more. Oh, I don't think that's true. It's also a very beautiful hamlet with a great school distract and beautiful. I guess they're distracted from school down there. It's a beautiful hamlet with a really great school distract and beautiful expensive homes and top priced real estate about a 25 train ride to manhattan i guess he left out minute either you have to take 25 trains and 10 minute that, drive that's not to- right either that's not it's not 25 minutes from plainview to manhattan and on well, the train on the long island railroad no it's not it says right here plainview is it's probably a half hour drive to suffolk county and it's a 25 minute train ride to Manhattan and 10 minute drive to the beach. That's what Rob is saying. Cause he says, you know, nothing. And he, as a matter of fact, he finishes, he said a lot more, but I don't want to misquote him, but just tell him to stick to his borough and I'll stick to long Island. Have you been told off and suitably chastened? Yeah, oh, oh yeah, sure. I'm, I'm zooming in on a map right now. Plain view. It appears to be is right next to uh, Suffolk County. 
So that didn't appear to be right. Well, course- right next to, well, goddamn. California's right next to Nevada, but it's still a, a fur piece between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. However, if you live close to the border, it's right there. So Plainview is right there. There's no way it's a 25-minute fucking train ride from Plainview into Manhattan. If you think that, you know, this, that right there is the sign well, that. that this whole fucking email is a joke. Hey, Rob, fuck you. Don't ever fuck with me on Long Island, especially the South Shore. I'm the king of the fucking South Shore. Go fuck yourself. All right, Randy McNally, now that we've established where the fuck Suffolk is. Um, Suffolk. Suffolk County. It's, yeah. it's It is a bunch of crap and then the Hamptons, which in its own way is a bunch of crap, to be quite honest with you. Suffolk so it. Yeah. Um, there is a fine Expensive real estate. Case. I grew up in Lido Beach and Atlantic Beach, you idiot. I'm talking about expensive real estate. Grew up in the dunes. Fuck you. You. Up, you grew up in Lido Beach, Atlantic Beach. And Long Beach. You're, you had Long Beach, you're a true son of the beach. That's right. Um. Anyway, there's a fine wrestling publication uh, uh, produced across the pond in the United Kingdom these days called Inside the Ropes. And, of course, it was named because our, our very good friend Kenny McIntosh and uh, members of his staff have a great deal to do with this magazine, as do... Our our friend, wonderful Willie Apter, and your friend, Brian, well, I, both of our friends, Brian Solomon, you just talked to Brian, bunch of people contributing to this fine magazine. And, and, and they send this magazine to me on a complimentary basis because I, I enjoy these, these type of things, but <laughs> God damn it. there's an article in the newest magazine, the newest issue about the role of the heel in wrestling and how it's changed and now you know uh, the the backlash on Ma- Max Caster uh for his rap a while back and what can you say if you're a heel now and what can't you and all this stuff and and I was I haven't read the entire article yet I haven't read the entire magazine yet but I was perusing it and I saw a picture of myself so naturally my eye was drawn to that and it's in this article talking about the things that heels could or couldn't do these days and used to be able to get away with and talks about the gangsters and smoky mountain wrestling which is why my picture was there because they wanted to sell magazines but anyway the article of the the uh, uh, the article the author of this article i don't know the fellow he must be new to the business james mcmahon hopefully he's no relation but <sighs> And I'm I'm not trying to take the piss out of this magazine. I've just said I I love these guys. I love Kitty McIntosh and all the people that are contributing that I know. I don't know James McMahon. He probably ain't going to want to meet me after I say what he just wrote. But I just want to read you, Brian, one little paragraph out of this story. Because we wonder why. I wonder why sometimes. I don't know whether you do. But I wonder why. People think the things that they do about wrestling and things that have happened or haven't happened in wrestling or where the fuck did that idea come from or why do you think that this is a thing that took place? You know what I'm saying. They, they People on Twitter, people on the the internet in general, they come up with the weirdest things to say about wrestling and that that they think they're convinced has actually taken place. So in this... In this article on New Jack and Mustafa, the gangsters in Smoky Mountain, you know, it kind of gives it the uh, the build up of how New Jack would address the crowd as rednecks and crackers and et cetera, and pre- reference the civil rights activists like Medgar Evers. Jack did that once, whatever. And <laughs> then here's this line. When the bell rang... New Jack and Mustafa would lean into every racist stereotype going. Many a gangsta's match would be won via the use of watermelon and fried chicken as foreign objects. (laughs) What? (laughs) Come on. It does not say that. I swear to God. (coughs) Many a match? Many a match. As in none ever. Many a match. I remember one promo. Yes, well, wait a minute. Many a, mag- many a gangsta's match would be won via the use of watermelon 
and fried chicken <laughs> as foreign objects. Can you see us talking about that in the finished meeting? Now, should you hit him with the drumstick, or would it be better if you get? No, nobody's going to believe that. Hit him with the breast. Well, wait a minute. There was a promo that actually was excerpted, I think, on the dark side of the ring. I was there. I was there for the promo. You were there. It was during fan week where Mustafa and New Jack came out for their promo at the desk. And did they have chicken or was it just watermelon? No, it was watermelon, I remember. I think there may have been chicken because New Jack had it. And the point wasn't, the point was to do it because that's what they were treating them like. Yes, because they came in. I didn't go get the goddamn chicken and the watermelon and go up to New Jack and Mustafa and say, hey, I want you to take chicken and watermelon out on your promo. They probably would have cut my throat. They went out, (laughs) got the watermelon and the chicken and brought it in and said, hey, we're going to take this out on the promo. And they said in front of what what was the town? What town were we in that night? Said, uh, oh, my gosh. It was it was Western Virginia, right? A little small town. I'll find Western. out in one second. Give me one sec. I think it was. But anyway, they're out there telling those people, this is what you want us to be. You want us to be the fried chicken and watermelon eating Negroes. Well, we ain't going to play that with blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, Mustafa is, is eating this entire watermelon and slobbering over and seeds flying and throwing pieces at the people and it was goddamn chaos saltville virginia saltville virginia so a, a, apparently see this is how this shit happens this is a, a magazine that honestly there's quite a few people brian solomon who just did the 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 chic book that is going to be released and brian elliott's and, involved as with that, we mentioned it? brian elliott who did fighting spirit magazine is involved so there are quality people involved in this magazine but yet is it just that everybody thinks that that's a thing that would have actually happened so they just overlooked it in the editorial process is that some urban legend that has taken life amongst it now i'm wondering what else can we not believe and that's the point i have people all the time on the internet when i'll rage and rant or be pissed off about somebody doing some stupid shit. They'll say, well, aren't you the person that booked so-and-so to do such and such? And I'll read that and I'll go, no, no, I'm not. (laughs) No, I wasn't. No, I didn't have anything to do with it. No, I wasn't even there. I wasn't even there. It was Owen because they've now people say shit like this and it gets repeated in, in some publication or some, website that people think well they should know what they're talking about and well then how horrible this is yes it would have been horrible if it if these things had ever actually happened but since they didn't they people still think i'm the one that made glenn jacobs the christmas creature in memphis you weren't even there i wasn't even there it was jerry (laughs) it was jerry it was jerry Ah, but we, how we, would you? We, I mean, watermelon. I guess I could understand. You would just smash it over the person's head. I would think. Yes, yes. But how would you use the chicken? Unless you, unless I, as a combo, as, you, know, like you have the bucket with multiple things and use it as one item. Well, now wait. A, okay, those KFC biscuits are hard these days, but I still don't <laughs> think for that. But I mean, maybe, maybe the deal was they were trying to shove the fucking wing bone down the guy's throat so he'd choke on it. That's the only way I can see that you could possibly hurt someone with a, a piece of fried chicken. How does it get into the article? Does this guy, Mr. Jimmy McMahon or whatever his name was, hear this story and instead of thinking, how do they do that? <laughs> Just go, oh my God, that's awful. I'm going to put that in here. <laughs> that's terrible. I've got to write about that. Listen, Jim, we want to do this promo with fried chicken and watermelon. No, no, that's wasting it. Take it in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> Use that chicken. Why use, waste the chicken? Use, use that. Well, this is before they had Delos. They had nobody to inter, <laughs> inter, interfere, so they had the chicken and the watermelon at ringside in case. There was the live chicken. That's what, you know, that would have been great if, if New Jack had brought a live chicken out and accused all the people in Saltville, Virginia, of having intimate relations with what he was going to eat for dinner. That would have been perfect right there. 
Sad to see James McMahon 30 years later could have written about it in Inside the Ropes. That is, I will say, and there are a lot of credible people involved with that magazine, that is a bit egregious that something like that got in that magazine. No I'm one proofread it? No one realized that's ridiculous? <laughs> The winner like, via fried chicken and watermelon, the gangsters. Yes. What? Or no, you're disqualified for violating the, the, the fruit and poultry rule. So they lost on disqualification. It was that three-month period where Jim Cornette spent thousands and thousands on new mats over and over again because of the watermelon stains in every ring. Uh, Inside but, the uh, ropes. Well, and, I mean, it's not just them, though. It's not just them. Buyer beware. Uh, what is it? Uh, caveat emptor or whatever. Uh, if when you read some of these things, if it sounds like it's really fucking even too stupid for wrestling, maybe check further. You know, but sometimes, Brian, I got to be honest with you, sometimes you don't know what you're reading, and that's because it's in code. Well, maybe you want to learn how to not only read the code, but write the code. And, of course, there's a wonderful way for you right now to begin a brand new career in coding. That's right. And now that you have set me straight on this whole thing, that it, the documentary that I saw was not about the kind of coding we're talking about here. I thought it was the, you know, when they talked about the meetings they have and everything, I thought it was the snake handlers. The speaking in tongues, I thought they were speaking in codes. You've set me straight on that. I now understand that that is not what Code Academy is all about. Folks, Code Academy is the perfect way to learn a new career. If you had coding skills, then it, then you would be, the whole world would open up to you. For example, you've seen how that um, if you write code, then you have to memorize it and then instantly ball the piece of paper that it's written on up and chew it up and swallow it to keep anybody from getting it. Now, a Code well, Academy will teach you how to memorize this stuff so when you swallow that paper, then you don't forget the important code that was on it. And as well, if it's if it's on audio tape, then you, you can only listen to it once because after it finishes playing within five seconds, it will self-destruct as usual. So you've really got to have a good memory, and that's what the folks at Code Academy teach you. Right, Brian? Well, yes, but no, they will what? teach you how to code, how to write code, how to build sites and do all sorts of fantastic things in the digital realm. I don't know about anything you said, but Code Academy is certainly a fine organization and a fine institution that teaches you a skill that you could take and apply all yes. across the board. All across the board in, in various espionage. No, uh, no. Uh, what? There's no, no espionage. There's no eating of notes. There's no espionage. There's no eating of notes. Well, it says it's an adventurous new way of life. I would think that would be espionage, P possibly if not governmental espionage, then certainly some of this uh, corporate espionage you hear about. You know, with Code Academy, folks, you can get qualified for in, in demand jobs in as little as two months. You can learn at your own pace and your own level. Even if that is a high level, a medium level, or even a subterranean level, lower than a snake's belly in a wagon rut that would gag a man eaten from under cheese in a septic tank of a slaughterhouse, you can choose what to learn from building websites to analyzing data to overthrowing governments and everything else you could want. No matter what your experience level, you'll be writing real working code in minutes that will have catastrophic effect on foreign governments. No, stop can, that. What? <laughs> There's no espionage, or no. you're not going to use this skill for espionage. It could be, but they're, 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 see, wink, wink, they don't tell you to do that. Oh, God, <laughs> they yeah. don't tell you to come right out and tell you to do that, but oh, these poor learn people. coding languages, including Python, Hitomal SQL, JavaScript, see, it's not JavaScript, it's JavaScript. So you have, it, that's where they send you these hidden messages in your coffee, and you have to decode them and then get it in touch with the embassy to <laughs> forward the information. If you're not sure where to begin, folks, and honestly, I don't know why you would be, Code Academy <laughs> will point you in the right direction. You can get that instant feedback that everyone craves, like, get off my leg. Your code is tested. What? <laughs> Your code is tested. <laughs>
<laughs> Get off my leg! Your code is tested as soon as you submit it, so you always know if you're on the right track, folks. There's an interactive platform that helps you learn by doing. You can do all these things on that platform. Just don't fall off. Build your portfolio. <laughs> get a certificate of completion to make yourself more marketable to future employers, such as shadow governments in the Middle East. Test your knowledge with <laughs> tailor-made quizzes just for you. You can even get tools and cheat sheets to help ideas stick. Glue would help with that as well, but you're not cheating with a cheat sheet. Anyway, folks, you can get help from other learners in the forum, other agents in the field, or connect with people near you using assumed names in your local Code Academy chapter. Be part of Code Academy's community of over 50 million people, some of them with fake credentials. Land your what? dream job in web development. Well, you got to have a cover. Land your dream job in web de web development, programming, computer science, data science, and tons more, including international intrigue. Join the millions of people learning to code and getting in trouble with foreign governments with Code Academy, and see where coding can take you. And you can get fifteen percent off your Code Academy Pro membership when you go to CodeCademy.com. That's C-O-D-E-C-A-D-E-M-Y, CodeCademy.com, and use the promo code EXPERIENCE, promo code EXPERIENCE at CodeCademy.com to get 15% off at CodeCademy Pro, where the best way to learn to code is at there. It's the best way <laughs> to learn to code. And bring bring all of your secret agent things, your decoder ring. Unnecessary. The, the gas pellets. Not needed. Not in the gas pellets. The gas pellets. Okay, you need to throw them down in the gas so you can escape. And what about the uh, the cyanide capsule that you can break? Well, hold on. Between w your teeth, just in case you're captured. Would you need gas pellets or smoke bombs? I would think you need smoke. You want gas to escape? Well, it'll knock them out, and they can't chase you. Oh, but what about you? You gonna have a mask? Well, you've got your gas mask in your lapel of your jacket. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Code Academy. That's right. And of course, Code Academy is great. Everyone check them out while they're still with us. Check them out while you can. Code Academy. Well, you don't have to go to Code Academy to not know what you're talking about. I proved that. But um, speaking of people who don't know what they're talking about or doing... I said it a few weeks ago, look what they've done to my show, Ma. The folks over at NXT, <laughs> are, is this going to be like the, the crash back in 29 where instead of stockbrokers falling from the skies, you're going to see trainees at NXT plummeting from the performance center roof? The, the show, the ratings are plummeting. The show has turned into a... Uh, a, a big kaleidoscope of unicorn vomit and greenery and the greenery is all around all of the green talent the, they've dismantled the whole program you barely see anybody that you knew all of the new guys are obviously fake names with corny gimmicks we're back to you know, I must admit, Tony D'Angelo is seeming like he's having fun with this thing. But Jesus Christ, it's fucking Razor Ramon, but on the docks of Jersey. Um, it's all 80s style gimmicks. They're right. Either Vince is writing this himself or Bruce is writing this or someone is writing this to appeal to what Vince McMahon would have done in the darkest period of the early 90s employment gimmicks garbage men and truck drivers and plumbers and hockey players and whatever and in the middle of all this they have the hottest rookie in not only the wrestling business now but what the last give me a rookie that's got as much upside and as much oomph already as rex steiner does already in the last 10 years help me off the top of my head i can't think of anyone so so they might as well just say tune in for the Rex Steiner push show uh on USA Network every Tuesday night. And that's the only thing that I watched this week. Um 
was Rex Steiner and Tommaso Ciampa against the Grizzly Young Veterans just because I want to see I I want to see Rex Steiner. I want to see what they're doing with him, but I want to see him. I want to see if it just his natural oomph can continue to overcome being on a crummy wrestling program. But um th- it, I mean did, do you see this as this the the two baby faces that are going to be at odds next week teaming up beforehand and having issues. I mean it's classic wrestling booking. But it also it's classic Vince with from the Hogan and Savage playbook or the Hogan and Warrior playbook. It's not classic Vince Sr cuz he didn't like to do baby face matches, but you could see that this is either you know if, if, this is somebody saying, I want to do a WWF style show just like Vince McMahon wants to do it. You can see that coming a mile away, can't you? Yeah. I mean, it's almost like there's a sad little old man who has memory issues and other people are preying upon him by foisting upon the public a style of wrestling that they think he would have championed when he was younger and more with it. Well, and... (sighs) There could be worse recipients, though, because they're doing this right with Steiner. He started the match, and he just uses his strength and his intensity and the amateur background just like his dad. He's not smooth because he's green. He's 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 got the idea, but he hasn't performed all these moves a million times, so he overcomes the greenness and doesn't even have to work smooth because he's got that aura. And it is just like if you go back and watch Rick Steiner matches, Mid-South in 85 and early Crockett in, what, 86-ish, 87, it's the same thing. He's just grabbing guys, picking them up, spinning them around, and he's strong enough to put them down safe where they need to go. And he's a beast, and he's got aggression coming out of his pores. So... As long as they don't try to make him start doing one tackle, drop down, hip toss, arm drag, drop kick, and expect that to work, what he's doing is perfect for him, and it's different because nobody else is able to do that shit. It, it just like either his father or his uncle, if he grabs you around the waist, you're going up in the air, and you're going to come down when he wants you to, and you don't need to be smooth for that. So they they shown. They shone. That is the past tense of shined. They shined <clears throat> Steiner early, and then they they portrayed the the deal that uh, Champa and Steiner are not on the same page because basically uh, Steiner wouldn't tag out, and Champa when Champa wanted to get in, so Champa slapped him on the back and tagged himself in, and then came in and he shone a little bit, kicked the shit out of both the heels, and then they stopped him and went to the break. And then, obviously, that's the wisest thing they could have done, get the heat on Champa because he's experienced. He can sell and not make himself look weak. That's something that we're going to have to see how where Steiner's at is in terms of next week when it's Champa and Steiner in a single match, Steiner's going to have to sell something. How will that be? Because it's easier to be a beast like that and be on offense and look good, but it's harder, especially if he doesn't have it naturally, it's harder for some guys like that to sell believably and not die or or still keep the people with him. We'll see how he does with that. But they got the heat on Champa, and then they worked a spot where Champa was able to get to the corner to theoretically make a tag, but Steiner had been drawn away by the other heel partner. And then Champa fights back from underneath during the long heat and gets to the corner again, but Steiner had been drawn away, and he got back up there just a little bit quick. But when he gets back up, Champa tagged him by chopping him across the fucking chest. And obviously that didn't get over well with Steiner, but he comes in, he, as he goes to, it's like he's going to swing at Champa, but Champa ducks and Steiner may, starts may come back on the heels. And, I mean, Jesus Christ, they're not going to play around with this because Steiner got the big comeback. He got the Steiner recliner on one of the heels. The other heel made the save, so Steiner just dumped that guy straight over the top rope, picked the other one up, and hit him with his press slam, power slam finish, one, two, three. 
beat them both by himself. And then that's when, that's when uh, Tommaso get, got his belt and walked off hugging the belt and Steiner's left in the ring. So we'll see what happens next week at Halloween Havoc. And you know what happens at Halloween Havoc? <laughs> People get scared. How much What do you think of this? I didn't see it because I don't what? watch NXT. <laughs> Although I'm going to watch next week to see the match, but I was going to ask you, how much time does Champa have left on his contract? Because it doesn't really seem like he's a fit in NXT anymore. Boy, I don't know. That would be interesting. And he wanted to stay in NXT because it was more of a fit for his style. And also with his injury record, he didn't want to be on on the road and, and on the full-time roster, you know, beating his body up. He thought it was a better fit. And now there ain't many people that Tommaso Ciampa can work with that. I, well, I mean, he can work with anybody, but there's not anybody interesting for him to work with in NXT really past whatever they're going to do here, which I assume this is not going to be a long drawn out rivalry between Champa and Steiner. Steiner's going to be the face of NXT and they're going to fill it in with the underneath gimmicks and greenery gimmicks and greenery as we head into the holiday. I guess that's kind of the question. Do you think NXT is still going to have a quote unquote face of NXT or is it going to be a true developmental place where, all right, Rick Steiner's a champion. He's ready. Let's get him up. Let's rush him up. Do you think they're going to give a guy like him time to develop there? Or are they going to use this as just a chance to elevate him as quick as possible? I, well, they're going to bring him up, I'm sure, as quick as... Well, I won't say as quick as... They're going to bring him up too quick, probably, from what would be optimum. And if there was a place where he could learn under the radar, that would be the the optimum thing. But they're not going to leave him on this TV program any longer than they have to. But it remains to be seen. I'm sure even, even if, at this point, they're going to realize we've got to see how he does. And we don't want to you know, kill the golden goose here and, and really yank him up before he's ready, but I'm sure they'll still rush it. But again, he's got a lot of Steiner's close to bulletproof because he's got that aura and that magnetism and that attitude and people want to see that. But um, if they're trying to protect him, then maybe they won't have him doing too much silliness, but we'll see whether they throw him in in the deep end too quick or not, you know, on, on the main roster. But I mean, <laughs> if you want, we could go back and look at the rest of the show in terms of just the, the recap, and I could give you all the names that you missed that I didn't watch either. And I think you would probably agree with me, but that was pretty much what that was. But I'm just, uh, Steiner is a guy, he, re I can't say he reminds me of anybody I had in OVW, but he reminds me of, of the quality of guys that we had in the early OVW classes when they were, you know, the Brock Lesnar's and the Shelton's and the fucking Orton's. And he's got that much talent, if not more natural talent athletically and for the wrestling business than any of those guys had at that time. I wish there was an OVW now where he could be for a 12 to 18 months. And good Lord, can you imagine when people actually saw him on a national basis, what he would look like? You mentioned the ratings before. I have not been following the Tuesday night ratings for NXT. Have well, been bad? are you kidding? Google it, motherfucker. Ever since they debuted the new NXT on, what was it, September 14th? That date sticks in my head. Uh, every successive week, the numbers have gone down. Because all of a sudden... <laughs> They violated a couple of rules of basic rules of wrestling. And one of the biggest ones is don't change all the talent at the, at the same time, because then, you know, people are like, what the fuck? And it, 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 that happened every once in a while in the territory days when a booker would get fired and take his crew with him, or there'd be something like that go on where all of a sudden it's new names and you take a big hit and you got to start all over because you're building up brand new people that the fans aren't familiar with except the territories did it quicker because they would bring in more veterans, more experienced talent, people that at least had some type of names. Whereas this is all green guys doing stuff that everybody else is already doing anyway. So it's going to be harder to get people hooked back into this, especially when they changed the entire style and tone of the presentation as well from 
that was the one program that everybody said, well, if we want to see some good wrestling matches, chances are we'll see them on NXT. And they took that away. So, <clears throat> 606,000 viewers this past week. Okay, does that have the last several weeks? It does. It has uh, pretty much everything since the summer, since before the summer, since the spring. Well, we'll just uh, start with September 14th, their relaunch. September 14th was a big jump for the record. September 7th, before the relaunch, 601. Yep. September 14th, 770. Then seven and, and, and by the way, hold on, because they had told people already, they had let out the news that the show's being completely revamped. They were taped programs a couple weeks before September 14th while they were redoing their arena. So that last one before the relaunch was basically advertised as the least important program that we will have. So there was 601,000 people. Then they get up to 770,000, which is uh, the uh, one of the better numbers that they've done on the program. And since then, now go ahead. The next week it went down approximately 25, 24,000, and it was at 746. And then the week after that, it was down to 655. Wow, that's almost 91,000 drop. 655 on September 28th, followed by 632. They maintained that big 632 the next week, and this past week was 606, which is the lowest since the relaunch. So again, 601 was September 7th. Now it's yeah. 606, October 19th. <sighs> so I'm glad they're not, uh, I'm glad they're not opposed anymore. And, but they're doing the, the over there on Tuesday nights, same thing that AEW is doing on Friday nights, tanking their program on purpose, apparently so that the ratings will continue to plummet. We'll get, we'll get to Friday's rampage in a little while, but at least rampage is 10 PM though. NXT is, that's an early show. That's 8 p.m. That's prime time. Well, and apparently no they're walking. not they're not ready for prime time. I wonder if if uh, Rex Bra Braun Breaker's first challenger will be Chevy Chase or Dan Aykroyd. Anyway, that was NXT, was it not? I assume it was. I take you at your <laughs> word that it was. You're not a liar that I know of. You know what I'm thinking? That if, if, see, you didn't even watch it. You're going to watch Halloween Havoc. I've been trying to keep an eye on my boy Steiner, but if I have to get through the rest of this program, I think I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need some assistance. I'm going to need a nice big box from our friends at WSJ Wine. I think that's what I'm going to need wine to get through NXT from now on. Well, you are a bit of a whiner, so it makes sense. Hey, now watch out there. I do not, I do not <laughs> whine unnecessarily. But anyway, folks, if you want to really impress people this holiday season, don't climb up on the roof of your house and hang Santa Claus off the chimney like everybody else in the subdivision. You join the folks at WSJ Wine. If you've got a dinner party to attend, need a hostess gift with WSJ Wine, you are never empty handed or empty stomached. You may be dizzy-headed, but that's your own affair. If you want to keep your wine rack stocked with new and interesting wines, WSJ Wine from the Wall Street Journal is the best way to find your new favorite wines from all over the globe. Because the holidays, as we know, are a time to reconnect, reminisce, and indulge, as well as ask people you know for the money that they owe you. But most importantly, the holidays are a celebration of togetherness, and with WSJ Wine at the center of it all, this holiday season will promise one joyful discovery after another. You can discover all kinds of things, especially after four or five bottles of this stuff. Folks, WSJ Wine presents the holiday top 12, the most wonderful wines of the year. You can uncork them all and save $125 because the people at WSJ have tasted over 40,000 wines every year and select less than 1% of them to be involved in this, this whole project here. Uh, each, each wine includes tasting notes and food pairing tips. You can rate your wines, refine your selections. You can probably even make some of your own in a bathtub at home, but they won't pick it probably for their holiday top 12. Anyway, there's a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't love a wine for any reason, you'll receive a refund, and you can receive a new dozen 
bottles of wine from WSJ Wine's most talented winemakers every three months. At about one bottle a week, you can enjoy at your own pace. Or at four bottles a day, you can enjoy until you flatline. Folks, members save at least 20% on every case they choose to take while earning exclusive rewards and VIP upgrades. And there's no obligation to continue because you've got the flexibility to delay delivery, skip a case, or cancel any time. And all jokes aside, we got the big box of this stuff here at the castle. And Stacy, who is the wine connoisseur, the sommelier, if you will, she loved every single bit of it. She's already crowing about it to her family and friends. So if you want to try this WSJ Wine Holiday Top 12, plus enjoy two bonus bottles and two wine glasses, all of that for $69.99 plus tax and shipping. That's ridiculous. That's that's incredibly cheap. Just text Jim, J-I-M, to 64,000. That's Jim to 64,000. Jim to 64,000 for the top 12 bottles of wine plus two bonus bottles and two wine glasses for $69.99. Terms apply. Available at wsjwine.com slash terms. What are your terms, Brian? I'm getting thirsty. Those are my terms, listening to you talk about this. I have to say, one of those boxes arrived here as well, and anyone who checks this out, it's going to be well worth it, because I couldn't believe how much stuff they sent and how much stuff I drank. And and as a matter of fact, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. <gasps> We're starting to worry about Hey! <gasps> starting to worry about you there. Anyway, uh, drink responsibly in the holidays, folks. Drink responsibly and constantly for the holidays. It'll all turn out fine. All right, we've got a uh, a special interview coming up that we recorded yesterday. I don't want to try to confuse the people and think that this is live. We recorded this yesterday because Tony Geezy from Heritage Auctions, a busy man, he's in the sports department, and we mentioned that uh, on last week's experience that uh, so several sets of my wrestling all-stars trading cards from 1982 and 1983 will be up for auction in the November Fall Sports Collectibles Catalog Sale. It just rolls right off the tip of your tongue. That opens October 28th at HA.com, Heritage Auctions. And uh, we we thought we'd get Tony on the phone not only to talk about these particular cards in this sale, but also the the explosion of popularity of wrestling collectibles. So, Brian, I believe you have the recording we made yesterday with Tony Geezy from Heritage Auctions. Can you... Cue that up and, and hit the button, and we'll talk some wrestling collectibles. We have it queued up. Let's go to it right now. All right, then. Joining us direct from Heritage Auctions to talk about the November Sp Fall Sports Collectibles Catalog Sale. We need an abbreviation for that one that's opening October 28th, this coming Thursday, that will feature, among other things, my 1982 and 1983 Wrestling All-Stars trading card sets. Tony Geezy. Tony, thank you for being on the program. I am honored to be here. I, I can't wait to talk wrestling collectibles. Well, and that's, you know, that's the thing because, I mean, before Brian Last is an old-time collector, I'm an old-time collector. We know a bunch of wrestling collectors, but now that the, the big wigs, Heritage Auctions, and <laughs> all of the other folks that have gotten into pro wrestling and wrestling collectibles over the, the recent past, let me ask you that Brian and I have talked on the show because I had a long uh, relationship with Norm Kitzer of Pro Wrestling Illustrated or Pro Wrestling Enterprises. I'm sorry, um, who did these cards and who did the wrestling news and a bunch of wrestling publications back in the 70s and 80s. And we've talked about, you know, the fact that it was a shoestring operation and that they didn't have newsstand distribution most of the time for their magazines. And so these cards were not exactly bestsellers in their day. But how did all of a sudden, from, from the heritage auction standpoint, from the professional collectible standpoint, how did these humble little card sets from 40 years ago blow up over the last several years in popularity and collectability? So what happened is these were mail order. So... 
right off the bat, they weren't in, in candy stores. They weren't at card shops. They were not easy to get. You had to you had to go through wrestling publications, and it was a mail order thing. So that was that's one of the factors. Not a lot of people ordered them, which is good for the collectability of them. The the cardboard it stock. It was bad is, for poor Norman. It was bad it for, was Norman. Was bad really good for rest poor of Norman. But the card stock is very thin on these cards, which is another factor. So they would they would damage easily, and also they were shrink wrapped. So when they were sent out in the series, I think there were three different series or two different series. When they were sent out, they were shrink wrapped, and Andre the Giant was the first card in the set. So a lot of times that card would be curled, uh, the corners would be, would be bent slightly. So you, when you factor all these things in, that, made, that, that makes high-grade examples of these cards really, really tough. And also, they have colorful borders. If you look at, like, Jake Roberts had orange, ba- uh, had, a, had orange borders. Bruiser Brody, I think, was purple. Andre and Hogan, uh, it's, a, it's a yellow bordering so these it's, things it's literally easily. the new day it's the new day from 40 years ago right these pastel colors that he it was yeah. the 80s hey it was my advice it, right it it just screams 80s and it, and also keep in mind a lot of them are are off center so you, you factor all these things into it and another thing is these are considered the true rookie cards of the of all these wrestlers there are Andre the Giant pieces that were issued before that. He went to Japan a lot. Um, I know he was up in Canada for a number of years. And there's, there are things from before this set that have been issued with Andre and Hogan as well. But this is considered among collectors as the rookie cards for all these guys. And they have just gained popularity through the years. And Jim, I know you can talk about this probably as much as anybody. There's only a few thousand of these sets that were released. And with so many of them having condition issues, um, any of the high grade examples uh, really bring good money. Well, yeah, that's because, you know, when I had looked at with my naked eye and I'm an old time comic book collector, as you know, from years mm-hmm. and I know how to grade comic books mm-hmm. and I, I, you know, have an eye to condition of things because I've collected so many different things. But I was looking at that. Wow. The corners are sharp and everything. And so when we, I sent them to you guys and you had some of the official graders take a look at him you know when it came back like seven and eight i was like oh and you were like no no that's good i'm like that's good and then I'm, i looked at the yeah. uh at the you know the grading where like anything six and above it we're getting into excellent mint territory and it's just small gradations uh between them but like you mentioned when i was on the phone with uh with you and and mike from the social media department the other day uh that uh, like the Iron Sheik card. I didn't know Sheik was hot, but the Iron Sheik at a 9.5 was like a just a jaw dropper. But the the Hogan that got the, the Flair 7.5 and the uh, uh, Harley Race at an 8, and these things, they're fairly high grade. They are. They are. And, and just because, you know, there's so many pitfalls in this set that anything that you get in high grade, it, it, it takes on a whole different level. And just that half grade from an eight to a eight and a half or from an eight to a nine, the numbers go up so much just because a lot of people want to, you know, they want to get the highest of the high on these cards. And and also coming from you, I think adds uh, adds quite a quite a nice layer of <laughs> collectability as well because they're directly from you. You've been involved in wrestling for so long, so you get that historical added on. Well, and you I, know, I, here's I, here's the I, thing. I, I was thinking about this. Um, I'm kind of pissed that this didn't happen a year or two later because eighty two, eighty three, I had just gotten into the business, and of course, Norman had a lead time on these things and printing and everything like he did everything else because it was a a budget job. So Mm -hmm. I contributed some of the photography because he used a, we've mentioned my pictures, uh, the Lawler cards, Bill Dundee, Dutch Mantel, Coco Ware slash Sweet Brown Sugar, Jimmy Hart, Jimmy Valiant. I can't remember the whole list, but it's a bunch of my photography. So if it had been a year or two later, I'm sure Norm would have given me a card, right? (laughs) <laughs> so this would have been the first time ever that someone who is a pro wrestling personality who also was a photographer for cards in the set and also had a card in the set would be offering his sets for sale. That's true. And I That's missed true. out on getting the card in the set. Drat. <laughs> Newman. 
<laughs> but I, I will say that the photography is beautiful on these too, because it's not like ring shots. These are all posed photos, and uh, the photography is very clear. And there, there's great, great images of of these wrestlers. I mean, from right before the golden age started. Well, now you say it's it's a great photography, but so, a lot of those Brian and I we know the original photos that we've seen them because Norman was. Uh, very notorious for reusing the pictures because back then you used to have to make a color separation to do the color printing. It's not like today. So every couple of years he'd reuse it. His magazines and programs are going out to different places. He'd reuse the picture. So those, the card pictures were cropped. You ought to see the full ones. Sometimes they didn't look so good, but, <laughs> um, and we do want to say there are for folks who are going to the November fall sports catalogs, Oh, shit. I, I screwed that one up. November Fall Sports Collectibles Catalog Sale. How do you get that on the marquee, Tony? Uh, uh, if you're going you to You did that, a good job on that, <laughs> by the way. Better than I could. <laughs> but, I can promise but you. If you're going to HA.com for Heritage Auctions to check that sale out that begins, the auction begins on Thursday, October 28th. It closes for the cards on November the 18th. Um, but there are cards for every budget because we didn't have all of them slabbed as the kids say. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that some people might just want a card from my personal collection because these have never been sold ever. I got them for free. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was yeah, on the comp list. So if you want a card from the collection, I'm sure, you know, not every card is a high dollar card. I've mentioned poor Spike Huber. I'm sure he <laughs> might get some love somewhere, but anyway, as far as it, it, the overall world of pro wrestling collectibles these days um things are exploding like you know like every genre and people now that are really coming into the part of their life where they have the money to spend and want to recreate their childhood i've been guilty of that um but a lot of things are popping as far as wrestling collectibles these days and you know the ring worn stuff and etc cetera, etc cetera. what's heritage got their eye on yeah, I mean, the ring-worn material, keep in mind, just getting that stuff created was very expensive. It's all custom done. Uh, wrestlers typically wore these outfits for an extended period of time. They didn't just, it's not like a baseball player who might, or a football player that might wear a jersey for a game or two. These were worn for months on end Years. especially with some of the exactly especially with some of the robes i mean we've sold we had a pair of carrie von eric boots from his, his world class days went for over five thousand dollars and that was now if they sold again they would they would probably be in that eight thousand dollar range and that was only two years ago when we sold these and uh you know even like rick rick flair we had a flare robe that went for which we quote photo matched uh, we had a photo of him wearing that exact robe. It went for for about twenty four thousand. So um, the market's really gone up, and uh, we you know had, it, it, it mm -hmm. pisses me off. I Flair gave me a pair of his boots one time because wow. I was driving. Well, no, he didn't give them to me. Give them to me to take home. He said, "Here, take these," because I was driving and he was trying to get rid of stuff because he was on a plane or whatever. So I had his boots in my closet for a couple months. <laughs> I said, "Flair, you want these boots?" He said, oh, "Yeah, bring when you think of it, whatever." And then. I gave him to a friend of mine. This was 1990. I gave him to a friend of mine for a Halloween costume, Cat Collins, who introduced me to Rick Rubin. And Cat never gave him back. And I bet you he ain't still got him today either. <laughs> that's a then. great story. <laughs> but that's the thing. It, 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 Tony, back in those days, there was no, there was no way to sell your ring worn things to the fans. There was no set. Mm -hmm. There was no internet. There was no, nobody was set up to do that. Also the heels, you know, they didn't want your shit to begin with. And sure. so what happened was stuff got worn until it got worn out and then it got thrown away. And the only uh, time you really got something from somebody in the business in the 60s, 70s, 80s is if they gave it to you, if they were your friend or you just asked for something or they loaned it to you and you didn't give it back or whatever the case. Um, so that's why that stuff and from that era is so hard to come by even today because so many of the, I probably kept more of my stuff than almost anybody just cause I'm a pack rat collector. You know, I inherited mm -hmm. it genealog genealogically from my mother. Uh, Jimmy, don't throw that away. It might be worth something someday. 
So, and, and also the thing is with wrestling gear, it's so displayable. I mean, just think about some of, some of your jackets or, you know, like the Macho Man robes or the Ric Flair robes on a mannequin. It looks so beautiful. And you can put that in a man cave. It just jumps out. Some of these other, you know, some of these other sports items, they, they don't have any, any of that kind of, I don't want to say flair, but, you know, have that kind of. Um, <laughs> Je ne sais quoi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what the WWF did in the 90s? Um, they had some really great merchandising and marketing people in, in their departments, and they started doing, which I thought was cool. They would take the ring canvas from a pay-per-view, like SummerSlam, mm -hmm. and they would cut it up into whatever it was, 300 individual eight-inch squares or whatever, and put it in a plaque with a picture with somebody in the main event, have them sign it. And that was cool to put on the wall. And they were actually on that canvas, that type of thing. Um, Which is a great idea because then, you know, people can afford it. It's not too expensive. And also, if you have the entire canvas, how do you how do you yeah. <laughs> put that up? And, you know, it, it's so big. I mean, but cutting it up makes perfect sense. And then, yeah, it's a great collectible. And they've done a nice job now of marketing their stuff. I've got an 18 foot by three foot Smoky Mountain Wrestling ring banner, or apron banner, if you'd like to uh, auction that someday, because I can't even display it. I haven't got a wall space 18 <laughs> feet uninterrupted. But um, yeah, you know, that's the thing is people now, it's kind of like, and boy, if I was you working at Heritage Auctions or any place like that, that I've seen the videos from the New York Comic Con or the people at Metropolis and these Detective 27s are just hanging off the walls. And I, I would be pulling some kind of Ocean's Eleven job if I was you with people. <laughs> I, would, I would raid that place because I love that shit. Security the, is it, very tight here, I'll say that, in the well, office. I, I, I can only get into so many doors. <laughs> I don't know about their drinking habits. If they're tight or whatever, it's none of my affair. But nevertheless, um, it's kind of like Silver Age comics have be the keys have begun surpassing the the Golden Age prices because people now you know in, in the Golden Age comics were so valuable from the seventies and eighties especially in that time period because that was people with money recreating their childhood. That's exactly and now it. uh, it's a combination of the average age of the person who read Action Comics number one off the stands is dead and. The the fact that it's been so impossible to complete runs of Golden Age comics for so long that people, they gravitated toward collecting the Silver Age, which is was easier. And now, but now those things and the best examples of have just shot through the roof because that's the the audience recreating their childhood. So it, it's kind of the same with wrestling. I always, I looked at the magazines, programs, pictures, anything in wrestling from the 70s 80s oh that's the new stuff you mm -hmm. know to me because you know and i was into i want the 30s the 40s the 50s well that's still a uh, in demand stuff but it's a more smaller specialized audience of us true i don't want to say true historians like everybody else is phony but really the people that are deep into the history whereas the wrestling items from the modern era now 70s and the flair and hogan era and beyond has really has taken over the the spotlight. Yeah, I mean it it really has and it's just it's just there's just not enough of it out there and so much of the material that is out there they're in private collections never to see the light of day. And even now with WWE hey, I, I buying open stuff my too. Every once in a while, I open the curtains and let the light come in on all that Do stuff you? that no human will ever touch. <laughs> I mean it's it, it and it's you know and it's become more mainstream now too. Whereas before it was kind of, you know, there was, it was collectible, but now it's just becoming more and more mainstream as the years go on. And there's a lot of investors that, that I know that are buying wrestling cards from the, you know, from the eighties and the, even into the nineties. Now you're starting to see it with the rock, you know, the rocks rookie card. And, uh, there's, there's, you know, it's just, you just see it keep going up and up and up. Well, as there becomes more people in the world and the same number of those items exist and you never, you never get any more action, uh, action number ones or amazing fantasy 15. Sometimes every once in a while due to accidents, you lose one. So mm -hmm. that obviously makes uh, things with a set print run or manufacture run and more people are interested in it. 
it makes it more collectible. Um, that's what I worry in some cases, but, but we won't have to worry about that for 20 years. What is going to be collectible from this generation's top that's wrestling a, superstars? That's a great question. I think what you're going to see happen in the next 10 years, the Attitude Era. Because there was a renaissance in wrestling in the late 90s. I mean, especially with the WCW and the WWE or WWF, you know, going back and forth the Monday Night Wars. I think that stuff's going to go up a great deal. I think your Stone Cold Steve Austin stuff, of course, The Rock being The Rock. I think that stuff will appreciate and value even the autographs. I mean, there's, you know, Rock autographs. He used to sign quite a bit. Now, because he's a Hollywood guy, you don't, you know, he's much harder right. to get to. Hogan signs a lot, but a lot of the autographs, too. I mean, Andre the Giant was a very difficult autograph, especially toward the end of his life. He did not want to deal with signing, dealing with having to deal with the fans. He was in a lot of pain. So, you know, the autograph wrestling market is very strong. And I, I think you're going to see the Attitude Era stuff going up considerably because so many people got into wrestling in the late 90s. And I but think if, that is an untapped source. And, and I think, but I'm just wondering in, in 20 years or 25 years or whatever it is from actually the year 2021, who's going to be the collectible wrestlers? This will be interesting because it's a... Uh, it's a motley cr assortment that we have when you stand them up next to Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair and these type of people. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But what yeah. what else, by the way, uh, since we're going, we've just dominated the, uh, the, the November Fall Sports Collectibles Catalog sale. We've dominated it with talk about my all-star wrestling cards. But what else is in that auction from... From other genres. Sure. I mean, we've got a lot of baseball cards that that market just kind of exploded in the last five years. So we've got, of course, a 52 mantle. We have we usually have about five or six of those. We've got a really cool Mickey Mantle game worn jersey, which has an 800,000 estimate on it. Oh, Th that being one of the nicer Yankee jerseys, of course, of mantle. We also have a photo match Joe DiMaggio which they literally match the pinstripe alignment on the, from the home jersey from 1946. So a lot of uniforms, a lot of baseball cards. And, and it's, not just, it's not just old cards. The new card market is very strong too. So there's, there's, there's a lot of quality. We have a Pistol Pete Maravich uh, LSU game-worn jersey. So he was, of course... Um, probably one of the greatest college basketball players of all time. So there's a lot of variety and a lot of cool items that are, that are going to be in this sale. When you, let me just relate this to you. When you mentioned the Mickey Mantle jersey, mm -hmm. at first, the first thought in my mind was, you know, Jim Ross loves Mickey Mantle. Oh, and, he's Oklahoma. That Mickey makes Mantle sense. is okay. one of his heroes, yeah. and in, in past years, every once in a while for Christmas, if I would be traveling and I'd run across a collectible shop or something with something to do with Mickey Mantle, I would I would get it and give it to Jr. And when you mentioned a oh, Mickey Mantle jersey, I was like, well, well, boy, that would be a great present for Jr. Until <laughs> you mentioned eight hundred thousand dollars, and I oh okay, well no. No, well, I you can get him a nice, you can get him a nice autograph baseball for about 500 bucks. So that would be, uh, and then you, you can add two JR on it yourself and you know, you can make it personalized. <laughs> In the wrestling business, there are people that sometimes do custom personalizations. If you know <laughs> but I was going to say, you know, I got my Andre the Giant autograph in 1976. And so he, and, and his penmanship was, as a matter of fact, I don't know how it was in later years, but I was surprised to see that his penmanship was so fluid. It was almost feminine uh, to Jimmy Andre, the giant. It was just lovely. And uh, may, I can trade you that for the Mickey Mantle jersey. I'm not saying JR would get it now, but I'll give <laughs> that to you if you're willing. It's funny that you mention Andre because I bought one and it – and. Uh, I didn't realize it was about maybe five or six years ago. I didn't realize he was Jean Ferre. And when I bought mine, it was in Canada and it was signed Jean Ferre. And I, cause I'm like, wait, that's Andre, but why is it not signed down to the giant? But then I had to do a little research and sure enough, 
it, that was his name in the 70s, and I had to get it authenticated and everything. But, yeah, I mean, Andre, he did have very nice penmanship. You're right. <laughs> it's just so – he is just so expensive, and especially on, like, photographs or anything because – everybody he's a cult hero and he that's one of the guys that kind of transcends generations everybody loved him and uh you know there's just not enough of his material out there for our fans my guy and you've got to think also him holding a pen in his hand would have been like trying to write with a toothpick I know. I could only imagine. I could only imagine how it was. And especially, like I said before, as the years went on, he was not easy to get to as far as for autographs. And he just really shied away from it, especially probably after he, you know, like after WrestleMania three in that time period told he passed, he was really hard to get to for autographs. Well, bye, Cracky. He's not going to be hard to get to in the trading card category in the November Fall Sports cat- Collectibles Catalog Sale. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. You got a nice one. I mean, you, I'm, you, I'm going to get it down. By the time the thing's over with, I'm going to get it down. But it opens this Thursday, October 28th. Uh, the bids on the trading card set closes November 18th, uh, but the auction runs till the 20th on various other things. It's the 1982 and 83 Wrestling All-Stars card sets that uh, have been in my vault for all these many years, along with a bunch of other cool stuff. And as we mentioned, in uh, by the time that the 28th rolls around, if you go to jimcornette.com, there's going to be a banner on the front page you can click on that will take you right to the lots of my cards that are going to be offered in this thing. And Tony Geezy, we appreciate your feedback. and. Uh, Good luck with everything else in the auction. Uh, just Thank as long you so as you much take for care having of me, me first. Just take care of me first, and then everybody else is fine. <laughs> but We got uh, you. We definitely gonna, have you. <laughs> it's going to be the start of a beautiful relationship, because I tell you, your, your, your friend Matt McGee, I've still got to talk to him about some of my comic-related items. we got to get that started also. But anyway, uh, thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much. Take care. Well, there it is, Jim. As we said, we recorded that conversation yesterday. And, you know, it's a lot of fun to talk collectibles and talk memorabilia. You and I are both big collectors of wrestling memorabilia and, quite frankly, things beyond wrestling. And it's a lot of fun to hear conversations about the collecting aspect of it and, of course, where the marketplace is. You never got into baseball cards, though, right? Never? I I, I didn't. I never got into baseball. Baseball was I, I liked basketball. Because of, the, you know, the University of Louisville and University of Kentucky around here, basketball, they've always got great programs. And we had, a when I was a kid, an ABA team, the Kentucky Colonels here, and it's Artis Gilmore and Louis Dampier. And, Did you, know, you go live? Went, Did you go to um, ABA games? I went, I went to one when I was a kid, yes, at the Louisville Gardens. Um, and so, I, you know, I could get into basketball and also football. My mom was a big football fan. I never got into football, but I can watch it for a little while. But baseball, gee, man, he crushed. I, it's just so slow and me, and I could not, I could never force myself to do it. So baseball cards weren't a thing either, but they used to have trading cards of like TV shows. And I've got Batman trading cards from the Batman 66 TV series and a set of lost in space cards with pictures of various scenes from the TV (laughs) show. I've got all kinds of trading cards, just not, um, there's a set of Superman cards from the show with George Reeves in the fifties. Oh, Oh, that's cool. But what, what is your most treasured wrestling item in your collection? Turning the tables here, asking you a question. I don't know, because I never really think in those terms. Like, you know, what is... Like, people ask me that, too, about my baseball cards. Like, what is the best card you have? I don't know. I never, like, think of it that way. You know, it's... But it's, they're, like, like you were telling me the other day, you have a favorite child. I didn't say that. You, no, you I did not. You tell them, but you have a favorite <laughs> child. I did not Either say it, that it, at all. But, no, no, but what, what would be your your favorite item in your collection of wrestling memorabilia that you're, like, I just couldn't lose that. You know, it's really weird. I don't really have that kind of mindset. Um, I mean, it'd be like the totality of it. Like, I love the wrestling news collection as one unit. I love my program collection as one collected unit of ever-expanding programs. It's hard to just signal, you know, like, I like the stuff I got from the Gorgeous George, you know, restaurant. That's cool stuff. I don't know if it's my favorite. 
See, I always I, I play favorites. I always have a favorite thing in in one in whatever genre. Like the but you know my favorite or my most treasured wrestling collectible would be the St. Louis program set. I figured so. Harry White, of course, hooked you up with the O'Connors, and God damn it, you got those programs. Yeah. The Sam Muchnick bound set that sat in the St. Louis Wrestling Club for all those years, autographed by Gene Kaniski, Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk, Terry Funk, Ric Flair, Harley Race, and Sam Muchnick himself. Um, what, but, about the, what about the Houston programs? Where, where do you think of those compared to the St. Louis ones in your collection? Well, the problem is I've just got, I've got several bound sets from Paul Bosch's Houston office, but they're, it's only 1970 through 1975. The St. Louis programs go 1945 through 1980. Um, it was the St. Louis just because of the the cachet that it had in the wrestling industry and because it was, you know, much Nick's, you know, bound work, life's work there. It said, I just, you know, I, I put the St. Louis programs and because of the autographs. Uh, and that is unique in the world, head and shoulders above. Now, but also I have an individual favorite program. What's that? Which was the program from the night that the Fargos sold out Madison Square Garden against Rocca and Perez that came from Jackie Fargo's personal collection. Wow, I never heard about that. Oh, I got I got that. Uh, was that from oh, Jackie or his daughter? <clears throat> it, well, it was from it was from Jackie via a guy in North Carolina that knew the family and, and he was a, an aspiring wrestler, but he also used to go and do chores and help out. And Jackie had given him some things. Are you and surprised that Jackie Fargo would have kept that and would have had it? No, because see, that's something, even though the guys in those days didn't, most of them didn't keep a lot of their stuff or, you know, memories or uh, uh, memorabilia or whatever, because it was business. That was Jackie Fargo was a guy from a little small town in North Carolina that before he's 30 years old is in the main event in Madison Square Garden in New York City and in front of a record crowd. Um, yeah, he had he had two copies, as a matter of fact, uh, because that's a, when I saw the, the guy showed it to me because he had some of Jackie's stuff. And Bobby Fulton used to go up to China Grove and, and help Jackie and got some things from him and but he showed me the program, said, how much you want for it? Oh, I couldn't sell it. I said, I'll give you $50 for it. He said, okay. <laughs> and then as he handed it to me, I gave him the $50 and he said, well, he said, I hate to tell you this, but look, he pulled out, he had another one. He had two of them. And I said, I hate to tell you this, but I'd give you a hundred dollars for that one. <laughs> 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 but that in individual program, my favorite magazine, probably I have the wrestling illustrated magazine from the precursor to the wrestler from London publishing. This came out in 1965 with the cover of Luthez and Bruno Sammartino, the dream match that they were actually talking about at the time, but never took place. But I got it personally autographed to me by both Thez and Bruno. So it's one of a kind in the world. Um, one of my favorite programs is one that came from the Houston office. Cause I got all the stuff Nick Bockwinkle had all the programs. Cause that a whole office got divided up multiple different ways. Peter Burkholz has a complete set of the programs bound. Obviously a lot of the stuff went to the family. That's where there was that big Paul Bosch estate sale, which was a fucking debacle. We can talk about it some other time this yeah. past summer, the artful Dodger apparently has some stuff. And then there was the stuff Nick Bockwinkle had. And that's how I was able to get one of my favorite possessions, now I think about it, the program for Antonina Rocca's debut in Houston in 48. Oh, shit. I didn't know you had that. Yeah. that's That may be my favorite program. And I got other cool ones. I got like- Well, that that's a milestone yeah. happening in all of wrestling, not just Houston wrestling, because Rocca, one of the faces of the business, along with Rogers and Thez of the 50s, his first appearance, that would have been his first appearance- well, in the United States, right? That's what I thought. And it was certainly his first big build appearance. I mean, it's Houston. It was a major town, especially 48. Coming off the National Wrestling Association. Yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a big player. But Rock Rims got in touch with me and told me that there's a record of Rocka working a spot show the night before. Son of a bitch. And I don't even know if there would be a program for that. but Probably not. But this program is certainly one of my... Uh, I got a whole bunch from 48. This one's 
probably my uh, favorite one. I got the uh, first program for Thez's first ever trip to Hawaii to defend the NWA world title. The first ever one from 52. And I got the ticket stub in there too. That's cool. So, and as a matter of fact, I have some, we could do this all day. I have some ticket stubs from Nashville from the 1950s, uh, not ticket stubs, but actual tickets untorn. Oh, wow. That I have every reason to believe that Christine Jarrett would have sold or handled. These were probably leftovers. She didn't sell them because they weren't torn, but would have handled because that was her job at the time. So all of these things bring one thing to mind, Brian. If anything was to ever happen to your treasure trove, to your archive, just like me, you'd probably have anger issues. You'd need somebody to talk to. Yeah, I mean, there'd be bodies everywhere. Bodies everywhere. Well, folks, whatever's going on in your life, before it comes to the point where there would be bodies everywhere, perhaps you should call our friends at BetterHelp. We've talked about them for so long on the program. We've read emails, testimonials from many of the Cult of Cornette members on how that they made a difference, the BetterHelp made a difference in their life, and hopefully they can make a difference in yours. BetterHelp is a professional counseling service done securely online with a broad range of expertise available, which may not even be available locally in many areas to begin with, but this is something you can do from home through video and phone sessions. No waiting rooms, no long trips, no going out in the pandemic. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You get timely and thoughtful responses. You can schedule the weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Financial aid is available because BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. You can do that also by staying away from Brian Last's memorabilia. Folks, (laughs) visit their website now and read the testimonials that are posted daily. And join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Visit BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, BetterHelp.com slash drive. And you can get 10% off your first month services. That's a special offer for our listeners. 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash drive. Or just leave bodies laying everywhere in the streets like Brian Last wants to. You know, all kidding aside, we do hear from a lot of listeners, and I feel like we've been hearing from them more and more, that have been telling us they've been using better help because they heard it on the show and it has been helping them. And it feels good to know that the listeners are the ones who need someone right now, the ones who need some help are able to get it right now. And it feels good to know that we're helping some people. Well, yeah. And, and you know, for a variety of reasons, people haven't wanted to go out. And even before the pandemic, there was a situation where there's some stigma if you're trying to seek therapy or whatever so this is private and secure uh but at the same time like you said we do get so much feedback from the listeners that say that you know we just we appreciate the laughs and and that the program gives us and we appreciate the tips because this made a difference in just how i was able to process stuff being able to talk to somebody so anyway the folks at better help are there to help and i need to talk to somebody at AEW. Apparently, I need to talk. I thought you did. I thought you were on the payroll. That's everything I keep hearing is that well, I'm, Tony I'm, Khan's paying Jim, and I'm like, hey, we're, how come I'm not getting anything? I'm refunding him his money. I'm sending him his check back this week because he's, if he's not even going to try, see, we were going to record yesterday, but I, I had the schedule changes, and I said, well, at least we'll be able to get some feedback on the program by recording on Saturday morning on what happened on Friday night's rampage. And so I sat down attempting to watch this program that was it just like August 20th. I believe it was, was August 20th when this program brought CM Punk back to pro wrestling after seven years and scored somewhere around, what was it? 1.1, 1.2 million viewers in thereabouts right so it can happen people are not genetically predisposed to ignore this program it's a it's a valuable piece of television real estate you could use it for good right right we've seen it we've seen it what were the what well we don't know what the ratings were last night yet 12 hours ago but 
the ratings of Rampage have also, why don't you go ahead and Google that? Because they've been dropping. I was going to say, we would know right now what the ratings were if they were head to head because WWE would have leaked them already. Well, yeah. One would think that they, they, WWE will probably take out billboards telling people, hey, be sure to watch Friday night's Rampage. If you haven't already, find it somewhere and watch it because that will be the biggest damage that they can do to AEW as a company to tell people to watch this fucking program. So the ratings have been going down on Rampage since Punk's debut. Now we expected that there would naturally be some drop because you got a once in a lifetime event. You can't do that every week. But now we have already gone. What was last week? Last week was basically half. They've dropped in half. Last week, which was October 15th, was 578,000. So basically, in two months, they fell back to where they do ha did half of what the Punk Return Show did, and that has been with Punk Wrestling. Because we, we talked about it on a couple of the shows here recently. They, they were in a situation where one of the biggest stars in wrestling who hasn't, hadn't entered a ring in seven years and people were confused and or mixed in their feelings on whether they would ever see him again. People didn't know whether he'd ever wrestle again or not. People didn't know whether he's going to come back. And then suddenly they tee, oh, here comes CM Punk, the blah, blah, blah. And they get a big number. And after that, yes, they want to see CM Punk wrestle Darby Allen. But then since then, We've gone to Daniel Garcia, fine young man. We've gone to Matt Seidel, fine young man. Who's next week? The fucking lead singer of the fine young cannibals? I mean, they, they devalued the idea of CM Punk wrestling on television by making it too commonplace against people that Let's face it, you know, everybody knows CM Punk was going to beat Daniel Garcia. Everybody knows CM Punk was going to beat Matt Seidel. They did good with him and Hobbs. They did good with him and Darby Allen. But now they've taken withdrawals on their goodwill account of CM Punk to where last week he was meaningless in terms of a number because nobody gave a fuck about his opponent. And they know at this rate, they're going to get to see him wrestle in the next week or two again anyway. But one thing that at least that there was happening as a good byproduct of punk wrestling underneath guys was that they were having the best matches of their careers and it was somewhat elevating them and making them look better in the people's eyes. That is why if I was CM Punk, as soon as I saw the first match on Friday night's Rampage, I would have gone to Tony Khan and asked him, are you fucking kidding me? Is this a fucking rib? I have a match with Powerhouse Hobbs, one of your budding new superstars that has all the talent and all the potential and all the tools in the world, and I gave him his best singles match that he's ever had and hopefully gave him some on-the-job training and elevated him in people's eyes. And two, three weeks, whatever it's later, you lead the Friday night show with Powerhouse Hobbs against the company mascot. And you beat Hobbs with the joke. Just because, Tony Khan, you for whatever reason think this clown is cute and you dressed up like him on Halloween. Our little dog pockets beat Powerhouse Hobbs in a tournament match to determine who's going to get a shot at the world title. So you not only beat Hobbs and undo every good thing that CM Punk did for him, make him look like a complete idiot, but at the same time, you take a shit on your own world championship because you put the company mascot even in the tournament, much less to do a job, you put the company mascot in a tournament with the winner to get a world title shot. And then, as I said, you beat 
Powerhouse Hobbs with self-same company mascot on national television. Punk should fucking, he should either go up and just snatch Tony by the neck or he should say, you know what, when you're serious about this business, call me, I'll be at home. Why did they have Punk do what he did with Hobbs, for Hobbs, to turn around and shit in Hobbs' face on national television? Well, let me just say for the record, I I have no problem with the Punk-Hobbs match, except for the fact that he now had this ultra-long competitive match with, as you put it, the company mascot, who, you know, again, that's where there's one of those big disconnects. There are AEW fans who love Orange Cassidy, whether they watch him ironically, as people say it, or whatever it is, they like the silliness of it. There are people into him, and then there's people like me who say, it's a skinny guy with a really stupid gimmick. Why am I watching this? And quite frankly, I said this before, Powerhouse Hobbs has as much upside as anyone there. Why is he doing a job for this guy? <laughs> and if, 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 even if you like the fucking goof, right? Even if you're one of these people that likes to laugh at phony wrestling, which that's the audience that they're primarily appealing to still, why does it make sense for this guy to beat Powerhouse Hobbs? Why should this guy be in contention for the world championship to begin with? Does anybody really think that, and I mean, I, although I I will catch that statement before it even comes out of my mouth, yes, Tony Khan may be insane enough to put the world title on this fucking idiot at some point. But that doesn't mean that anybody else with cognitive thinking believes that it, it should happen. But the, it's... For one thing, nobody has yet ever explained what this fucking thing is anyway. Why does he do these things? Why does he act this way? What is the fucking deal with him? Nobody knows. Nobody cares. It was a one-note joke two years ago that wasn't funny to me, but some people giggled at it. But now you know who Pockets reminds me of now? He reminds me of Captain Lou Albano. You know why? Because Lou Albano was a great character in wrestling he was one of those just great personalities just as my mom mom used to say he it didn't he he didn't have a character he was a character he was always with the jokes he was always a motor mouth blah 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 <clears throat> and every time i would run into captain lou in the 90s he would tell me the same joke he would say boy i hope your shirt's waterproof because that ties a real pisser and it wasn't really funny, but you laughed the first time because it was Captain Lou. But then the fifth or sixth time, you'd you'd smile and you'd you'd laugh because it was Captain Lou, but it wasn't really funny anymore because it wasn't really that funny to begin with. And then after about 50 times, you're like, I knew you were going to say that, Captain Lou. It's way past old with this guy. It was a one-note joke that wasn't funny at the start except to certain people. And then it got less funny and nothing has ever changed. There's nothing different about it. Does the same shit. He looks the same. He does the same shit, which is almost nothing. And it's an embarrassment to the professional wrestling industry. So that was the opening match on the show. Then Britt Baker wrestled. Was it Anna Jay? Anna Jay. Well, there you go. And then the main event was Andre Ole Oleo against Pac. So they just said, fuck it, we got nothing. Are you saying you didn't watch Andrade no, versus shit. Pac? When they opened the show with the company mascot beating one of their supposedly future superstars in a tournament for a world title shot, and then follow it up with dork order women against Britt Baker, and then finish up with Mumbles Nelson against Pac. Who's the baby face? Who's the heel? Who gives a shit? I didn't. No, this was a joke program. They just gave up. They said, fuck it. We got nothing. Let's just waste our hour and put some shit out there. I... It was a good match, I'll say. I, first of all, I enjoyed Britt Baker and Anna Jay. I know you're going to dismiss it just because she's the Dark Order girl. Britt Baker has become really good in the ring and is perfect in terms of being Britt Baker. And Anna Jay shows a ton of potential for someone who's only been wrestling a couple of years. 
and only had a handful of matches before she started in AEW. I thought it was pretty good. And then I mean, I, you know what? And I like Britt Baker and her promos and everything. If there had been a legitimate match in the first segment, then I would have I watched it. the girls because it's only an hour show and it's not that long of a time. But after I'd had to skip through, because I refuse to watch the shit, I'm not going to watch this fucking guy. After I had to skip through pockets, then they give me a girls match. I'm wanting to see what it is about this program, the reason that I was watching it. So when I've got to the main event is Andre and Pac, fuck it, I'm done. Well, what you missed was, it was a pretty good match. You probably would not have liked it. But <laughs> the lights go out. Malachi Black is in the ring. You don't know whose side he's on. And then him and Andrade beat up Pac. Until the big save from Cody Rhodes running in in a black shirt from the crowd because he learned his lesson with wearing white. <laughs> and, of course, that Miami crowd, which would have popped at anything. We saw that in the last couple of weeks. This was taped in Miami. They gave Cody a little bit of a pop. It'll be really interesting tonight as we are recording Dynamite. It's Cody versus Malachi. How are people going to react to Cody going forward? It was a situation where I felt like they forced it. You know, it's one of those situations where a guy runs in, he's the baby face automatically. So you're not going to really boom unless you completely hate him. And that Miami crowd wasn't going to do that to anyone except Dan Lambert. It'll be very interesting to see Cody's well, reaction. Well, okay, here's the thing. So they align Malachi Black, who honestly, because of his gimmick and his personality, intrigue, aura, mystique, whatever you want to call it, should he be aligned with anyone? No. Should he be aligned with baby faces or heels? No, he should be a single entity of evil. But did they try to, to uh, involve him with Andre on the theory that maybe then the people might cheer Cody and boo Malachi Black instead of the other way around. Who knows? Do they even think that deeply? Um, so now Malachi Black, who's really getting over with the with the base audience and etc., is aligned with Andre Mumbles, who is deaf. I mean, let's face it: the guy's very talented in the ring. He was talented as La Sombra. He was talented wearing a mask, but. This just isn't doing it for me. I don't care how talented you are. He's boring. He bores the hell out of me with this, whatever this, I don't even understand what his gimmick is. He's rich. Is he rich? He's rich. They're all rich. They're all rich. Him and Leo and Matt Hardy. They should all just get together and hang out off TV and talk about how they're going to spend their money. Closing Rampage thoughts. No, I don't blame you. You know what I mean? <laughs> This was a garbage television I kind of wonder how many other people, if I figure there has to be an audience that does the same thing or thinks somewhat similar to you, how many other people actually see something like that and turn it off? I know the AEW fans, again, there's an audience that sees Orange Cassidy and just can't wait to watch him do the same thing he's done every single other time for the last couple of years. But how many other people see that and go, eh, it's Thursday, yeah. it's late. The Astros are about to go to the World Series. I can go watch an exciting thing like that, or I can go watch this, this taped show with Orange Cassidy. I'm, t I'm just telling anybody that's ever been a fan of professional wrestling, if they see pockets in the ring, they're going to change the channel, turn it off, or watch something else or do something else, because it's insulting. Just the sight of him is insulting to a true fan of professional wrestling. So... They put him on for the same audience that they always get, and that's what they probably got, and that's dropping. And, they, and, and you still, I'll say one more thing, and then we'll move on. Tony, you're still not learning. Your audience was dropping with the same old indie-level mud show clowns that you've been shoving down people's throats for a fucking two years now because the only people that ever wanted to see those assholes in the first place were the people that were already watching them. And all of a sudden you start getting big jumps of hundreds of thousands of people. When you bring in real talent, mainstream stars, guys with experience, veterans, people that know what they're doing. And then you got an hour of national television time on a Friday and you lead it off with burying one of your only homegrown potential superstars making your world championship look bad and making anybody besides the most desperate for entertainment of your base audience turn the show off because it features your fucking favorite mascot. Jesus Christ. 
Well, if you can't watch Rampage on Friday night, that means you have an extra hour in your week, and you can devote that to some of the fine podcasts from the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Right, oh great, Brian? Oh, what a delicious idea, and I want to thank you and encourage everyone to do just that. If you've given up on Rampage, give in to us, succumb to Arcadian Vanguard, get information about- yes acquiesce if you will to us acquiesce and of course get information about all the shows on twitter at super podcast or work together on facebook at facebook.com slash arcadian vanguard a few notes we're going to be talking some mid-south wrestling on the jim Cornette shows in the upcoming weeks so right now go check out the mid-south wrestling television review podcast with myself and mike mills a week-by-week look at mid-south wrestling television from the end of 1981 Right now, we are in the end of 1983, including the debut of Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express. Catch up on all the shows at MidSouthPod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention of Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry. It is Jeff Baldrin's birthday this week. Happy Happy birthday. birthday. A spry 70 years old this week. Happy birthday, Jeff. And of course... What? Wait, hold on. No, he's not. I mean, he says 70. I think it's actually 75, but... No, he's not. He can't be. He's not. I was totally fucking with him by oh. assigning him a larger age, a bigger age than he well, actually I had. Well, I I had to be... I, have, I had to defend him. because No, he can't be. He can't be that old. He can't... He's got to be only 67. Well, obviously, someone is here on this show defending Jeff Baldrin, but will anyone defend him on Breaking Kayfabe this week, where him and Barry Rose speak with Savio Vega? Hear that episode right now at baldrinpod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Do you know what what Dutch Mantel told me about Savio Vega? I never knew this until he told me while we were all together in TNA Wrestling. No. He said Savio has a twin brother. Because, you know... Well, Savio's real name is is Juan Rivera, and he's got a twin brother, looks just like him. His name is Amal. But if you've seen Juan, you've seen Amal. All right. Yeah, exactly. Boo. And by the way, on the topic of Jeff Baldrin, a little bit of a correction here on the air. We talked about last week with the Luna Vashon Dark Side episode, that photo of you and the unmasked Blackhearts from when you skipped out on going to the Bahamas. Yes. You mentioned that Jeff Boundrin went to dinner with you guys. I think he did, didn't he? Well, I heard from Pete Lederberg, who says, not only was I there, I took the photos. Pete Lederberg was there, too. I remember that. So there's the correction this week, but of course... Well, well, wait a minute. What? Did I say that Jeff took the picture? I just said we went to dinner with Jeff. You said, oh, it was Jeff and Heath and Nash, and yeah, we had a great old time. <laughs> I forgot to mention Pete. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Pete. Well, of course, Pete has been a guest before on the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Hey, boo on me! Boo on me! A phrase never heard except for in one song. Go through the archives today at 605pod.com. Hear why everyone who listens calls it the greatest wrestling podcast of all time. New episode in production right now, The 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. Well, from one mother to another, let's go to the mother of all crown jewels. You know, they they are trying to make Saudi Arabia seem like this this new age is dawning. This new what did they call it? The the at one point they were calling it an Arab Spring a while back in other countries when they started to come into the modern era and leave the neanderthal caveman stuff behind and now they're they're doing this as a pr campaign to basically tell everybody how great saudi arabia is it was every hit every head rolling down the hill has a crown on it at the crown jewel a place that brings out the best for all the world to see was a line in the cold open package, a place that brings out the best for all the world to see. That's right. Now that women are allowed to show their eyes, even the women in Saudi Arabia can see it. They blew off more pyro than they did in the Gulf War. And 
instead of I got a kick, I must admit, I watched the open because I wanted to see what they were going to how they were going to say this. We're in Saudi Arabia, a place where the government kills journalists and fucking cuts them up with bone saws and fucking puts them in suitcases and carries them out of embassies. And we consider women to be, uh, you know, property and or they must be covered up because we obviously can't contain our horniness because since we're all a bunch of religious lunatics and God will get mad at us if we have sex, we got to cover the women up and jack off in a corner and not tell anybody. What the fuck? And then Michael Cole, Corey Graves, and Brian Sax Byron Saxton Instead of introducing the Spanish language announcers or the other, they introduced the Arabic announcers, Fubar Makafakaloub and Slapko Fud. I get somehow what? Corey Graves what? nailed these names. I don't, Corey Graves pronounced this, these names like he'd been doing it all of his life. Maybe he's part Saudi. I don't know. But this whole thing is so, we'll get to the women in a minute, but it just, it's preposterous. A long sleeve shirt on a dumpy referee that looks like she's a cashier at Arby's because somehow if she's showing her arms, that's going to send the entire population of this screwball country into a fucking horny sex frenzy. Uh, so she was the referee for the Hell in a Cell match, which went on first. Seth Rollins and Edge, Hell in a Cell. First match on the show. They have Camel's stage side, just in case. Um, And, you know, these people... <laughs> what? Go ahead. They don't have to worry about the ASPCA or PETA over there, I don't think. And no, they, and they're probably going to eat the camels as soon as they're finished carrying people to the ring. But the the people over there, they're obviously with the uh with the program and with the you know they know who the people are edge was over especially with goldberg because it's like all international shows for shows in foreign countries it was like this in the 80s for the wwf and and everybody in the business used to say this that the international markets are years behind america not in terms of Oh, they're so behind, they don't have electricity over there. I'm talking about in terms of who's over and what's hot. And the the people in international markets, you know, were always, that's why when guys would be released from the WWF, they would go on these independent tours and they would still be big names and, and they would draw because the people would think they're still with the WWF. Maybe now in today's, internet era that's tightened up a little bit but you could still tell still you could tell that they were still happier to see a guy like goldberg and they knew the entrance and the chant and the whole thing than they were more of the modern people you see what i'm saying there's a little bit of a time lag you get over here first and then the tv goes over at other places and you get over other areas first but i i i i really want to like edge and I really want to like Seth Rollins' matches, even though, as we've mentioned, the the interviews of both these guys are just telling them to do drama class shit and they're writing scripts for them and everything It's instead of doing wrestling promos off the top of their head. But this match, I understand, a lot of people went batshit for this. Oh, it was a great match. They started at 100 miles an hour, punching each other a thousand times, and then Seth took a bump and rolled out. And within one minute, he had missed a dive out of the ring into the cage. You can have a match even in the cage. I feel like we missed the first 10 minutes of this match because they just started at 100 miles an hour. It's the first match on the show. Maybe they had a warm-up match. I don't know, but the people are still pretty easy. So instead of starting the match and fucking... <laughs> Take a bump in the ring or two before you hit the floor and start rattling each other off onto the steps and the cage. And there, there was one bump in the ring, and then they were out on the floor. Edge pulls two chairs out from under the ring. He grabbed the metal rod, the chair strut that they've been using for the cross faces. Seth got it and tried to stab him in the eye. So now it's the first match on the show. 
There's already chairs in the ring. We're in a cage to begin with, hat on a hat. And now Seth Rollins, four minutes, not four minutes into the match, is trying to stab Edge in the eye with a metal rod. Then they go back to the floor and into the cage. All this stuff looks brutal. We just started in the middle of a fucking match. We started in 10 minutes in with gimmicks in a gimmick match. And then Seth got one of the chairs and hit Edge hard seven times over and over. Just like he's trying to kill a goddamn cockroach. Then he put the chair under Edge's head, took the other chair, and he was going to give him the concerto, but Edge, who just literally seconds earlier had been obliterated by seven Paul Bunyan chair shots, grabs Seth his ankle, trips him, just pulls his legs out from under him with one arm, and gets him in a cross face. But Seth gets the chair spoke and stabs Edge in the eye. We're less than 10 minutes into this match, and I can't take it anymore. I'm starting to think, should I fast forward? But then Seth hit a beautiful frog splash off the top rope and got a two count. That kept me for a second. Then right as soon as he did that, he rolled out and pulled out a table from under the ring. And I said, fuck it. I'm done. I'm, I'm going to skip 10 minutes, see what happens. Because, by the way, did I mention I'm watching this on the cock? I got no on-screen fast forward. When I turned this thing on, it said the show was four hours and seven minutes long. Brian, does anybody in the world want a four-hour blowjob? It depends. I mean, who are you with? Well, I mean, at some point, goddamn, take a break, get a Sprite, walk around, watch some TV. Get a Sprite? Yeah. <laughs> Gotta keep hydrated. <laughs> um... <laughs> The show is four hours long and it's on Peacock and there's no on-screen fast forward. So you can't tell what, because the entrances are interminable. And then there's the PR pieces. And then I found out too late. And I told you this and you didn't even know that the crown jewel was actually also a pay-per-view. It was on the regular pay-per-view channels. I had so no I, idea. I, I did not hear a single word about it being available anywhere other than Peacock. I had no idea. And how, if, if they're going to air it, I would have paid the $50 so I could have had on-screen fast-forward capability because I hate the Peacock. We know that me and the cock don't get along. So I would have paid the $50 to be able to fast-forward some shit and not have to fucking go back and forth, blah, blah, blah. But also, how stupid are they? They've got a pay-per-view on a pay-per-view channel, and they don't tell anybody that it's available. So anyway, I skip ahead 10 minutes. Don't know what was happening. But when I come back, Edge is in the ring laying under a ladder. Seth Rollins has set a table up in the middle of the ring and is laying Edge on top of it. So in other words, this is every fucking match ever. Can we have a match without chairs and tables and kendo sticks and furniture and stupidity? Because it's just repetitive. Rep repetition repeated repetitively. Seth sets the ladder in the corner and climbs up and he's going to fucking jump off on him. But Edge comes up to fight him. They tease a superplex off of it, but don't. They fight some more. And then Seth, sunset flip, power bombs Edge off the top of the ladder through the table in the middle of the ring. Cover. Two count. Fuck. Five more minutes. They're still going. Edge is now tying up Seth Rollins with a chain. Plus, he's got a cross face on Seth with the spoke of the chair in his mouth. And then he lets him go. Right as Seth is going to tap. Then I say he's going to tap. He's going to then he lets him go. Because then he gets a chair. He puts the chair. He doesn't. He takes a chair in his hand. 
he doesn't just draw back and just scramble Seth's brains with the chair. Instead, he puts the chair under Seth's head. Seth, you know, cooperates by staying there. And then Edge hits the ropes and comes back and gives him a curb stomp on the chair. That's it. One, two, three. This was almost 30 minutes. Nobody could live through all this. Gimmicks everywhere. In the first match on the show, interminably long furniture matches that numb people to every bump in the book. That's the perfect place to put it on first. So everybody's seen everything before anybody else gets a chance to get in the ring. <sighs> Your thoughts. Well, I hated the match and I've hated this feud. And I forgot about Crown Jewel. So I turned it on as it was already happening. And this was the first match I saw because it was Hell in a Cell. I thought I missed half the show. So I was like, oh my God, what's going on? And I even tweeted out. Hey, how many more matches are left? Do I have time to get coffee before, you know, the one match that you want to see? Yeah. Everyone replied, yo, there's plenty of time. There's all these other <laughs> matches. And I did. I went out and got coffee, got a Wendy's uh, grilled chicken sandwich, came back and got to watch the last three matches. Yeah. Well, you know what I, what I wanted to do after this and what I did were two different things. Because what I wanted to do after this was just give up on the whole thing and say, well, I'm not going to sit through another three and a half hours of this nonsense just to see the one match between Reigns and Brock Lesnar. But then I decided, you know, if I just walked away for a little while and did something fun and then came back, then I would probably, um, I'd probably be able to sit through the rest of the show. So what I did was I went ahead and I just took a few minutes, sat down, pulled out, the lawnmower 4.0 and shaved my balls. <laughs> well, hold on. I did not think this is where you were going. This is no, what you I did in the middle of crown jewel. You shaved your crown jewels. Yes, I certainly did. I got those jewels slicker than come on a gold tooth because folks, do you know what's spookier than seeing a black cat on Halloween? It's shaving your balls with anything other than manscaped because when it comes to below the waist grooming or below the belt grooming, there's no need to carve your pumpkins this Halloween because Manscaped is here to upgrade your grooming experience. Go from a bite-sized candy bar to a king-sized candy bar and join the 2 million men. Does yours melt, Brian? And join the 2 million men worldwide by <laughs> going to manscaped.com slash JCE for 20% off and free shipping everything on the site. Folks, have you ever tried to trim your balls and it turned into a Freddy Krueger film? Have you ever tried to shave your crotchal and taint area and you look like Ted DiBiase run through a razor blade factory in a 1985 Mid-South television program? Well, Manscaped is here to save the day and make sure that you're slick, shaved, and smelling fresh with the Performance Package 4.0, the new refined body wash, the greatest personal grooming product on the planet the lawnmower 4.0 you know it's a full moon out and the werewolf in your pants is howling brian Ow. <laughs> the, <Ow>. finely, <laughs> the finely tuned <laughs> trimmers in the lawnmower 4.0 feature a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents th thanks to the advanced skin safe technology. And you've also got the weed whacker nose and ear hair trimmer that helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in all of your delicate holes. Folks, if you want to stick something in any delicate hole, make sure that it's manufactured by Manscaped. Seal the deal with their liquid formulations, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. Manscaped will even throw in two free gifts to the Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. So folks, if you're looking like Wolverine and you haven't cut your nails recently, be sure to look into the Shears 2.0 Nail Kit as well. Life-changing products from our friends at Manscaped and 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com slash jce say trick or treat to your beautiful new halloweeny with manscaped <laughs> Woo 
All right. Well, speaking of weenies, Crown Jewel was still taking place when we last yeah. spoke yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, the next match was Mustafa Ali versus Mansoor. And, you know, I knew a guy one time. He was a real low life. He was born in the sewer. He lived in the sewer and he died in the sewer. He committed suicide. I was going to say, I thought that was Terry Taylor's nickname, Mansoor. <clears throat> Man, is he always sore. Yeah, you know, you you heard what um, you heard what the Norse god of thunder said to the girl at, after the orgy, didn't you? No, what's that? He said, "Hi, I'm Thor," and she said, "You're Thor. I'm Thor. Thor. I can hardly piff." <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so Mustafa Ali and Mansoor had a match because Mansoor is from Saudi Arabia. They're using the hometown guy. Nothing to matter with that. Of course, these two idiots thanked each other on Twitter for this grudge match they had. What an honor it was to be in the ring with you, you fine sir, even though we were supposed to hate each other from what we did on television. So they're fucking actors playing parts, not wrestlers. Um, also, Mansoor was from, Sa he's the one from Saudi Arabia. He didn't get to ride the camel. Later on, fucking... Bird ass riddle rides the camel. So the guy from Saudi Arabia didn't get to ride the camel, but the stoner got to ride the camel. Anyway, um, they had a match and they did an angle at the end with a Saudi Arabian Olympian on the, from the, was he from the karate team or the judo team or what specific combat sport was he an Olympian from? I'm not sure, but they were screaming about this guy once he revealed who he was because no one knew who the fuck he was when he walked in a ring. And once they revealed who he was, I still didn't know. The people there seemed to know, but yeah, well, I have like, no idea who like this guy was. It's like us seeing Kurt Angle when he was in, a, in the Olympics, but not a pro wrestler. The, it's their Olympians, so they knew who he was. We didn't, but anyway, he knocked Ali out with a kick. Um, and then they did this segment. Did you see the, uh, you might've been getting your Wendy's and that would have probably been a better use of your time. Beth Phoenix, poor thing. And, uh, Titus O'Neill were in the ring and they did a ceremony for breast cancer with breast cancer survivors, some from Saudi Arabia. And there's nothing wrong with that on the surface of it, except they, these poor women, we're wearing these ridiculous mummy wrappings while being honored for surviving breast cancer. They're still in those goddamn scuba diving outfits covered up from asshole to appetite. And it look and so <laughs> the government of Saudi Arabia thinks this is a positive thing, a way that a positive way that they can be portrayed when they have these poor women who have survived breast cancer and they've still got to wear these ridiculous outfits because of their strange mental deficiencies about the way they relate to other human beings in that fucking country. Now America's got no room to scoff at elected officials basing public policy and social standards on the delusional belief in a fictitious supreme being instead of reality. However, this is taking it way too far. So they did that to these poor women. They were probably like, we survived breast cancer. We just can't fucking show anybody our breasts. So then they had the match where I, you were still at Wendy's, right? Yes, I believe I missed all this. Good. They had a match between AJ Styles and his partner, Almost, who's almost ready to be a wrestler, against RK Bro, who came out on the in the entranceway, and then Riddle turns around and leaves Orton standing there, and Orton's like, well, where could he have gone? And they wait forever, and then here comes Riddle riding the camel. And I decided I was going to ride the camel right past this match. <laughs> I don't know if the birds flew out of his ass on his introduction. I forgot to stay long enough to watch. But I hit my button, and 10 minutes later, it came up, and Riddle was managing somehow to make AJ Styles look like shit with some awkward back and forth. So if he can do that to one of the best wrestlers in the business, I'm sure he can probably make anybody look like they don't know what they're doing. So I gave him five more minutes and it was over. 
Instead, we were starting Zelina Vega versus Dewdrop. Did you see any of that? I saw the end of that somewhat. So I'm, I'm guessing I didn't go yet to get my uh, coffee because I do remember seeing some of this. Well, I hope it was a chilly night in Saudi Arabia. I don't know what the weather's like over there, but these girls were wearing these fucking Arctic parkas. Poor Dewdrop looked like she it was a tarpaulin over a freezer. She's wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt, and she's she's a sizable young lady anyway. And it didn't look it, it the girls and the, the, the next girls match. It it just it's ridiculous. It looks unprofessional. I will anyway. So they had this match. And then they did another big package to make Saudi Arabia look good. Um, they had no comments from Jamal Khashoggi's family or friends on this package. Um, possibly some of his fingers may have been in the stadium. I'm sure they probably put all of his body parts kind of spread out where they wouldn't all be found in the same place. Did you see any of Goldberg and Lashley? Actually, I did see some of this, yes. Well... I, you know, I mean, th this was a mixed bag. Um, as I said, Saudi Arabia, they're, they were with Goldberg like it was 1999, and they gave him the whole thing, the, the security, the door knock, the Did long Did you see walk. the security? Did you see some of those security guards? Well, yeah. Well, they just pick up random schlubs wherever, but, you know, we're not expecting that these people should actually look like legitimate security. Are, are we at this stage of the game? Why is Goldberg the one guy that needs security? Well, we don't really know. That's never been established. Is it that they're afraid that because he's such a celebrity, people are going to try to attack him? Are they afraid that he's going to go off like Brock Lesnar and attack the people? What exactly is the reason for all that security? They're afraid he's going to do a promo. That may be possible. Um, so the whole thing, it takes forever, but the people like it. And the, he looks great for his age. I mean, I'm not saying that. And as we've mentioned, the combined age of Brock Lesnar or Brock Les of Bobby Lashley and Goldberg is 97, right? 45 for Lashley, 52 for Goldberg. Is that what we came up with? I think while so. Back? Yeah. So for a combined age of 97, this wasn't a bad match, but. What the fuck are that? Does anybody, does anybody bother to stop and think about any kind of quality control or in, make any sense with this? They announce the match. The match ready to begin. The bell rings. Lashley's in the corner and he's got his back turned to Goldberg and he's wrapping a chain around his fist. Now the chain in wrestling around the fist is a tried and true, old as the hills wrestling gimmick. You can make your own brass knuckle. You take a dog choker chain about 18 inches long and you keep it in your tights or your knee pad or whatever. And when you pull it out and you wrap it around your fist, it's visual. People can see it. The referee can't. You use it. Boom. It's great, right? Lashley had a chain that looked like you would haul a fucking boat with it. It had to be, it was pulling it out of his pants, but it had to be three feet long. And it was, the links were huge. If you wrap this around your fist and legitimately hit anybody, you'd break every bone in your hand and fingers, wouldn't you? It was a pretty big chain, I have to admit. It was huge. So then Goldberg rushes Lashley in the corner and gets all over him, even though it, it's not looking good because Lashley's covering up because he got a chain around his fist and then he turns around and starts throwing punches and hits allegedly hits some of them came in the vicinity some of them didn't but he goldberg was selling them somewhat he allegedly hit goldberg nine times punched him with a chain wrapped around his fist and goldberg went to a knee there was no blood there was no Nothing's wrong with his face. He didn't go down. He wasn't knocked out. He took nine shots with a logging chain around a guy's fist that weighs 275 pounds, went to a knee, and then 
Lashley dropped the chain, threw the chain out of the ring. <laughs> well, sure, after you shoot the guy nine times, what do you need the gun for? Throw it away and pick up a club. So he throws the chain out and shovels Goldberg into the post, threw the buckles into the post. And then Lashley, and I love Bobby Lashley as a human being as and as a talent. He was being told to do these things. This was a setup match. Lashley went to the floor and looked under the ring, but couldn't find a chair. So he turns around, he sees one at ringside. He gets it from ringside, goes in, bashes Goldberg twice with the chair, then puts it down and runs Goldberg back into the post. Then Bobby goes to the floor, <laughs> looks under the ring again, and pulls out the table that he was staring at and ignoring 30 seconds earlier when he was looking for a chair. And he pulls, I swear to God, all this was happening. Again, chairs, tables, ladders, fucking Jesus. So then it slows the match down and it takes you completely out of it. And why the fuck is any of this happening? And half the time guys can't find the specific thing they're looking for. So then Lashley tries to get the table in the ring and he's strong as a bull, but the legs just get stuck open. He's got to close them up. Can't hardly get it. And finally gets it in the ring. He goes over to Goldberg because now he realizes he's left Goldberg laying there selling for the better part of a minute. So he kicks Goldberg and then goes back and sets the table up and then goes back to Goldberg and gets back on him. And he tried to pilmanize Goldberg's ankle with the chair, but he put the chair on wrong at the start and he couldn't figure it out then. And then he, you could see that he wasn't sure. Well, what part of this do I stomp without really breaking his leg? Cause the chairs and he just kind of made some shit up. And then he came off the ropes with a big stomp to the chair, but he had to miss the chair completely and just act like he hit it or he'd broken Goldberg's leg because the chair was on wrong. And then Lashley goes for a spear, but he Goldberg moves and Lashley goes through the table. And then Goldberg finally comes up after all this time, hits him with a spear, a jackhammer. What a fucking feat. Hit it, hit it at Goldberg's age on a guy that size. Didn't cover Lashley after the, after the jackhammer. Goldberg took an inordinate amount of time to get his gloves off. For whatever reason, I'm not sure, but it, he was intent on getting those gloves off. Then he threw Bobby out to the floor and speared him through the barricade. Brian, when was the first time that you ever saw somebody get speared through one of those black barricades on a WWE program? A few years ago, right? It's been a few years, yeah. How many times have you seen it since? Nonstop. Well, they didn't stop here either. So they go through the barricade. Then Goldberg needs to find something under the ring, apparently, because he went to a couple of different sides, a couple of different places, but he couldn't find what he was locating or what he was trying to locate. So he moved the stairs over on the floor and then went back to Lashley and bashed him into the desk and into the rail. And somehow Lashley ended up, his arm was cut bad. It was bleeding pretty bad. And so, of course, since there's a real injury the camera did everything they could to stay away from it. Um, then Goldberg picked up the stairs and tried to basically kill Bobby Lashley with the stairs, but Lashley moved. Lashley crawls down the entranceway. You've got Bobby Lashley, a beast like that. He's crawling. Goldberg follows, but as Lashley gets to the top of the, the entranceway there, there's Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin who were excommunicated from the Hurt Business quite some time back, right? But now They were, back. but I believe, because we don't watch Raw, we don't see what's happening, they may have been brought back well, into the yeah, Hurt Business recently. They were, they were reunited. When they realized, well, we fucked this up royally, didn't we? The writers, so they put them back together on Raw, but now they're back together. But MVP was not there. Did he take a stand on fuck you, I ain't going to Saudi Arabia? 
I'm not sure what MVP is. Um, because he was conspicuous by his absence. But anyway, there's Cedric Alexander, there's Shelton Benjamin, and guess what they've got? The only thing that this match was missing, the only thing that we needed, kendo sticks. I'm not making this up. They bring kendo sticks. The hand one to Lashley. They've got two of them. They charge Goldberg, and Goldberg just gives Sheldon a big boot and backdropped Cedric on the floor, got one of their sticks, and then just wore Bobby Lashley out with the kendo stick. I wrote, I hate this show. You can watch this anywhere. You can go buy a fucking ticket for $10 to any barn or rec center of any outlaw mud show in the country and see guys hitting each other with chairs and kendo sticks. This is a big time show with supposedly big time talent. And all they want to do is garbage matches, just like everybody else can do that doesn't even have any talent. And then Goldberg speared Lashley off the stage through three tables covered in a black cloth with something underneath them to soften the blow, but we couldn't really tell what it was. And at least it didn't go poof like Jericho's my pillows that he lands on when he takes his big bumps. And was this Falls Count anywhere? Because the cover and the pin was made on the tables in the back of the arena on the floor. One, two, three. Goldberg won. I don't know if it was or wasn't. I just kind of figure everything is nowadays. I guess it was. Um, so now we've had the hell in a cell with everything in the world. And then we've had the Goldberg and Lashley with everything in the world and interference and fucking chaos and gimmicks. And there's still two hours left in this program. Any any final thoughts on Goldberg and Lashley? Not really. And I know a lot of people really liked this show and thought it was a strong WWE event, but I couldn't get into it very much. And a lot of that may have been just the fact that it was the middle of the day. I don't know, but I wasn't. No, I mean, no, no because it doesn't matter what time of day it is. It's because you've seen all this shit a hundred million times. Nothing ever hurts anybody until the finish. They get up when they're run over with 18 wheelers. There's garbage. There's no rules to anything. There's no heels. There's no baby faces because you don't have rules. There's no way to cheat. There's constant foreign objects. There's ridiculous interference. The referees have no power. This is Gaga sports entertainment wrestling, just like AEW is Gaga indie outlaw mud show wrestling. And a few people want to break through and do something serious and professional but the only ones that can are the ones that have the power to not do what, because obviously these guys aren't going into business for themselves. They're being told to do this shit in these matches because the, the writers of this crap think this is what wrestling is because they've only seen, you know, more of this same shit. They think this is what you do in wrestling. For the last however many years that these writers have probably been, since they've been old enough not to piss themselves and have their diapers changed, they've been growing up on action figures with, comes with a chair or a breaking table or a trash can or a toilet plunger. I don't think this is the writers. I mean, this is Vince. This is what Vince wants. The writers aren't going, this is the wrestling I've always dreamed of. They're going... This is what I think I can get Vince and Bruce to approve. And I don't I, know how I, much of the actual in-match shit the writers are doing. I'd, I'd, well, honestly, besides the main events, Vince McMahon never approved uh, or disapproved or even gave a fuck about a lot of the in-match stuff unless it sucked. And I don't know why he hasn't said something about th this shit because it sucks. But no, this is writers, producers, and Mark wrestlers coming up with all this shit. Guess what match was next? Xavier Woods versus Foul Tell you. Xavier Woods versus Finn Balor. This is when I left. I know for a fact I didn't okay. see any of this. Well, and, and why would anybody? Because, again, <laughs> and this apparently was for the King of the Ring. 
And Xavier Woods beat Fan Finn Balor to become the new king of the ring. So now the heat's off of Mabel. Everybody was said the biggest fucking fiasco, the biggest shitty king of the ring ever, Mabel. And the whole way that Mabel, well, now the, the heat's off Mabel now. They send two, these two poor schlubs, Finn Balor and Xavier Woods, out to have a single match with no gimmicks and have it to have a wrestling match for the supposed king of the ring after everybody else on his card has been out there with chainsaws. <sighs> Next was Big E versus Drew McIntyre for another one of the world championships. Now, here you have two baby faces. One won the belt by virtue of a fucking gimmick in a heel-type cash-in, and the other one's been screwed out of it, and nobody cares about him anymore because they decided they were going to push him like crazy, and he beat Brock Lesnar, and then they just fucking dropped that idea, and he's done more jobs than a goddamn telephone repairman since then. Did you see any of that? Because I didn't. I didn't see any of that, no. Because after that match, there was still an hour left. It was three hours in. We have not seen Roman Reigns and or Brock Lesnar. And the next match was the triple threat match for whatever the fuck it was for. One of the women's titles, they've just sw switched them. We'll talk about that in a second. But Becky Lynch versus Bianca Belair versus Sasha Banks. And again, this is exactly what I wrote. How the fuck is this doing anything for, quote, women's empowerment when all these girls are wearing scuba diving outfits, wrist to ankle, because some fucking religious lunatics think God will be upset if he sees a girl's elbow? This looked like a training match in wrestling school, not because the girls can't work, but because they were all working out in sweats. It looked like a fucking practice match in wrestling school. This is supposed is a fifty million dollar show. It's the it's the biggest promotion in the in the wrestling business, and they have to be. They 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 are having to tell their female performers to go out and wrestle in sweatpants because of these people's warped, demented beliefs in things. I didn't watch this, obviously, because three-way matches are always rotten. These clothes looked ridiculously unprofessional and amateur, and we still got over an hour left on his fucking show. But I'm not going to take it out on these girls for shit that they can't control. I don't know how this match was or wasn't. I know it went close to 30 minutes. So if I'd have watched it, I probably wouldn't have liked it. Because, goddamn, I've, I've seen fucking oak trees grow quicker than this show was over. But I'm just, it's, and all the girls talking about, oh, we made history. And oh, we got to go over and do this and do that and bring women forward. It's not a giant honor to go to Saudi Arabia to begin with. It's risking your life in a land full of fucking nuts. But the only way to me that they would have moved women forward or made any difference in the women's revolution is if they went over there and dressed the way they normally did and did their normal shit and showed those girls, yes, you can do it, because we are. But to go over there and play by their rules and wear these ridiculous outfits because of these goddamn freak fucking thoughts that this weird society has, if I was any of these girls, I'd have said, if you want me to go and work and dress like I usually do, then we'll talk about it. But if they don't want me like I normally am, they can go fuck themselves and follow it up with a camel up their ass. What do you think of this match? I don't think I saw any of this match either. <laughs> Good. So we can move on because now what happened or what we've been waiting for for the past three and a half hours happened. Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. And what's Paul E. going to do? And... Even the, the package, they did a nice package with the history. And I, I was thinking at the time I was watching the package, I think this is the only thing on this program 
so far that the fans 20 years ago watching probably wouldn't have shit on. This is star power with bad asses and an intriguing story, kind of like they used to give them in the days of Austin and Rock and Taker and things like that. Of course, this match had controversy. Did you hear about the stipulation they announced and took back? I heard a little bit about that. What happened? Apparently on the pre-show, they announced that this match would be no disqualification. And then within 30 minutes, either at the end of the pre-show, where b before the thing even started, they said, no, nope, both these guys really don't have any interest in the no DQ stipulation, so it's being dropped. Because they figured out, wait a minute, we're doing a screwy fucking finish that if it's a no DQ match like every other match we do, it really wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't get the desired result. So they announced the the stipulation and took it back. But this was for another one of the world championships. But let's face it, actually the one that means something because Reigns is a credible ch a champion and Brock is going for it. So this is the title that means something. And Heyman's involved. Um, the entrances took over 10 minutes. And that's another reason why these shows are for, do you, I remember in the pay-per-views that did huge business in the nineties and early thousands, such as when they grossed $50 million in one night in the Houston Astrodome on pay-per-view with Austin and rock, those shows had a three hour window and we had to beat it by five, five to seven minutes. So they had time to re-rack the replay. Now these things are four hours plus and they're worse because they're now it, 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 in those days, Vince, if, if you, if it was the undertaker's entrance, you got time. If it was some bizarre entrance, like Michael's repelling in Anaheim or whatever, you got some time, but everybody else was like, make your entrance, milk the people and get in a fucking ring, get the match started minute and a half, two minutes should be fine. They've gone out of their minds with these entrances. That's why it's another reason these shows are four hours long. So they finally get in there. The introduction is taking place. The ring announcer introduced Roman Reigns standing in at a weight of. I swear to God, he said that I've played it back so I could standing in at a weight of. But then they got started. And it was a smash mouth match, serious stuff, two big guys. Brock kept going for the Germans. Reigns is trying to avoid them like a fucking, you know, sick man going for penicillin. He's going for those ropes to hold on so that, that Brock can't take him for the ride. And then he'd fight back and Brock Lesnar sells just like he should. He staggers. He doesn't take big bumps. He staggers. He's got facials like that was surprising or, oh, that stung or that hurt. But he doesn't oversell because he's a beast. And Reigns, finally, he, you know, he fought back a little bit and he bumped Brock to the floor and it, Reigns hit a dive over the top that looked like one of those old Undertaker dives. This wasn't some 170-pound little white midget diving onto a bunch of catchers this was a big grown man diving way over the top rope and he wiped brock lesnar out made contact and there was none of brock like oh come to my waiting arms he was waiting to hit get the impact and fuck you i'll take care of me and you take care of you and it looked like it hurt and then Romans hit a spear in the ring and got a two count, a big pop. They thought it might be over that quick. And then Reigns, the two of the Superman punches and goes for his big spear, but Lesnar leapfrogged Reigns and Reigns went into the fucking buckles. And now Brock is coming back. And did you notice Heyman at ringside normally he does the facial reactions fantastic, even though he's not overly animated physically of his entire body because he's so morbidly obese now he probably can't move around very well but his face is amazing but in this one it was a stone face he wasn't letting on to anybody whether he was happy or upset about whoever was in control so he didn't stooge off 
You know the question everybody wanted answered. And Brock gave Roman Reigns the German suplex over and over. And then he hit an F5. Boom, got a two count, which got a big pop. And then Brock goes for another F5, but Reigns catches him in a front face lock and tries to choke him out. Brock breaks it with a spine buster. Brock goes for the uh, next F5, but they wiped out little Nage, poor old Charles, Charles Robinson, the referee. And now Brock's got the cover, but there's no referee. So Brock goes over and he, this didn't make a lot of sense, but it was a cool visual. He picks Charles Robinson up by his belt like a suitcase. And then when he determines that the referee, who is the guy who can count the pin for him and allow him to win this thing, is not conscious instead of trying to, hey, pal, you know, bring him around a little bit, he just chucks him out of the ring. He's, ah, fuck it. <laughs> but it looked like something Brock would do. And then when he turns around, Rain spears Brock from behind and everybody goes down. Now, here's a problem. The only problem I detected with this, this took too long. The referee's down. Both wrestlers are down. Everybody's down. The clock is ticking. But there's not a lot of move. And Paul comes up to ringside. I, th I think this whole thing could have been tightened up a little bit. I'll explain how in a second but he's got the title belt in his hands and he throws the belt in between both Brock and Reigns and says, you know what to do with it. And they each look over and start reaching for it. And then they have the tug of war and Brock snatches it away. But as soon as he turns around, the Usos are there for a double super kick. Boom. And Reigns has got the belt. And he nails Lesnar a big shot and throws the belt out and covers Lesnar. And immediately, second referee's in the ring. What immaculate timing. How did it happen that way by sheer happenstance? One, two, three. It was a good finish. It was a wrestling finish. I can see Pat Patterson sitting down and laying this out. Problem is, Pat Patterson would have laid it out right and closed up the loophole I'm about to tell you. It's just bullshit when the exact moment that the heel does the damage the heel is going to do, the second referee comes out instantly, one, two, three, like that. Boom, as soon as Paul threw the belt in, as soon as they saw it and they both had a tug of war for it, boom, when Lesnar ripped it away, and also, they they shouldn't have laid laid there that long. They should have kept it moving. But when Lesnar ripped it away, right then the Usos could have been there for that double super kick. Boom. And then let a second referee come down as they've jumped out of the ring. Let the second referee come down and be getting them away from ringside. So the referee is kicking the Usos out. And that's when Reigns uses the belt. Boom and smacks Lesnar and chucks the belt out of the ring. And when the re second referee turns around, he's already down there. That's when he can see the cover and go back in. Boom. It just, it, it struck me wrong that just the instant slide in. I don't know. You know what I'm saying, Brian? It just, I do. it's so convenient. They were just all of a sudden there. Yeah. Why wasn't he there for the previous minute and 45 seconds? When your first referee goes down, as I've said before, the clock is ticking. Somebody within 30 seconds in the back, some referee watching or some official would have the power to send that person down to replace the injured referee. So everything within that first 30 seconds has to go on that a referee shouldn't really see. And then if you're going to do a run-in like with the Usos, do it at that point, then let the second referee come out and not see them doing damage, but see them there to be distracted by, to get them out while something else goes on in the ring. The whole thing takes 40 seconds fucking tops and you can get by with it because you've left Robinson laying out there for five minutes. And that's just, it's just, I can't, I can't imagine. I've never had to do a spot like that because I was in the wrestling business, not the sports entertainment business. I can't imagine what it would be like to have to lay unconscious, allegedly, in front of the fans at ringside 
for four or five minutes from taking a kick to the head or a stray shoulder tackle or whatever, and you've got to pretend like you're... And, you know, I've heard the people screaming, get up, you son of a bitch, you know you're okay. So you just... When you leave loopholes open like that for the people to turn to each other and go, well, look, at that's bullshit. He's been down there forever. What is he, dead? Then they're not paying close attention to what's going on in the rest of the finish, and you leave people the opportunity to run their their mouths about it. Anyway, um, but otherwise than that, it I don't know if it was worth going through four hours of the cock to see this match, but this was a good quality world championship match. What'd you think? I thought it was good up until the finish, although I like the Heyman thing of, you know, go for it, do what you got to do, whatever. I forget exactly what he said. You know what you know, to you, do. You know what to do with it. He, he was kind of, it was a play on the dynamic that was cute. dudes in the Midnight Express. When, you know, when, when Shane got the fucking chain and uh, away from Bobby, and then I grabbed it and threw it out. Said, now everything's fair again, and then boom. It's a kind of a play on that. But the same way I don't like the Young Bucks or anyone interfering in the Omega matches, that even if it's a match I like, it immediately takes it down. It's the same thing with Roman Reigns. I mean, I get the Usos are his, guy, but, are his guys, but at this point, every match, why aren't you looking for the back, waiting for them to run in? That spot wasn't really necessary. They could have done the tug of war with the title belt, and Brock could have jerked it away. And then they could have done something with Brock looking at Heyman like, what the fuck are you trying to pull here and let Reigns nutshot him from behind and grab the belt and do the same thing? I don't know. But the Usos just, it was more like we got to figure out a place to put the Usos in rather than we really need the Usos. Anyway, that was the crown jewel. My, what a sparkling polished diamond it was oh i thought you were gonna say what a wonderful propaganda campaign it was <laughs> uh, propaganda so the story is not over between brock lesnar and roman reigns because and they got back from saudi arabia in time to do smackdown in wichita kansas i know they got a private plane but i i didn't think you could get to wichita in that amount of time from st louis much less Saudi Arabia. But they were there live and to open the show. How many people do that flight? Where are you going? You went from Saudi Arabia to Wichita. Shh, that may have been a first. We got to call the Guinness Book of World Records people. Anyway, I, we're not going to talk about the whole SmackDown because there's two things of interest. Well, there was one thing of interest to me and then one thing that got interesting afterwards that we had to scope out. But basically, the Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, Paul Heyman saga continued on SmackDown the night after Crown Jewel, and they open the show with Reigns and Paul coming out live in the ring, and the story is that Brock Lesnar has tweeted out that he has sworn to beat Roman Reigns senseless as soon as he arrives at SmackDown that night. So, I mean, they recapped what happened at Crown Jewel. It's very good storytelling, but again, I think we were seven minutes into this show before Reigns opened his mouth in the ring is very slow and reigns immediately questioned Paul E. you know about his aim and throwing the belt at at crown jewel you know even paul handed him the microphone oh you did that one good that came right here and he basically came out and said told paul you're not great at your job and reigns i love his attitude and the inflection in his voice and the tonal quality in his voice and it sounds natural he sounds legitimate He's very heelish, but also well-spoken, and he just sounds like he's well acquainted with being an asshole, doesn't he? Right? He is perfect in his role. I you mean, sometimes believe. it's a little too perfect that it almost seems performy, but by and large, he's perfect in his role. So Reigns made... Paul E. read Brock Lesnar's tweet about, you know, he's going to come and beat to beat him senseless and then slap the phone out of Paul's hands. And again, Paul, what a toady. And he's just so spectacular at doing this. And so Reigns, the, the story is he's dared Brock Lesnar to come out and beat him senseless, and he's not going to go anywhere until Brock does. And they go to the break. 
And when they come back, Reigns is still there. He won't leave. No Brock yet. This did take a little while. And I, and I, again, I just said about the referee, they come out instantly right when called. Well, no, you should milk it a little bit. But this started to be just a little bit long. And then Brock music hits. And here comes Klondike Lesnar in the apparently the only shirt and pair of jeans that he owns. <laughs> um, well, he saved his money. He's not a high liver. Anyway, they have a big fight. Lesnar comes down like a badass. Reigns is there. Boom, they get in a fight. Lesnar hits Reigns with the stairs, tries to F5 him on the desk. Here come the Usos. Lesnar wipes the Usos out, shit cans them over the fucking rail. They did a decent spot with a camera where Brock snatched one of the TV cameras and shoved the cameraman down and threw it at Reigns, and he missed Reigns, and it hit the post. And those cameras, everybody knows they aren't cheap. So that, you know, gets your, oh, shit. But they made one mistake. They showed the cameraman in the shot before Brock did it. If you notice, and this is if you've ever been in a TV truck out there, ladies and gentlemen, some of you have. If you've ever worked with a really good television director, there's a reason why and how that you never, on a really professional-looking television production like the WWE, you never see the cameramen in the shot. Because they're all told to dress in black so as not to stand out. They're given, the floor camera guys are given positions at ringside where they can wander and vary and go back and forth, but they're also told places that they should not go so they don't cross into the hard camera shot. And also the director is constantly talking to him. And there's even a, a Timmy Walbert, a fucking magician at this shit where there was a way when back in the nineties, even when we would do those in ring interviews with me and Vince McMahon would be working the microphone for me and one or two of my men or whatever, you'd have a floor camera guy in the ring with you. And he'd be right up in your face sometimes. It used to aggravate me to the point where I couldn't look out and see the people and make eye contact with some of them at ringside because the cameraman was in the way. But when they'd go to the hard camera shot, you would never see that cameraman because he'd be told to back up to camera, back up to corner right or corner left or whatever. Well, here they stooged it. There's a cameraman dressed in black with a camera on his shoulder in another floor cameraman shot. And as soon as I saw that, I said, they're going to do a camera spot. And they did. Anyway. So the point is, it's this chaos at ringside. The Usos have been wiped out. Brock is trying to kill Roman Reigns. He snatches the camera. He throws the camera into the fucking ring post. Referees are coming out. Thank goodness. Somebody's going crazy, creating chaos, physically assaulting people. This was not on our format. This is unplanned. People have gone into business for themselves. We got to go stop it. That's the fucking atmosphere you're trying to create that's the vibe you're trying to give here come the referees there's officials coming out security you see adam pierce waving out the wrestlers this is wrestling everybody running around trying to stop this madman the heel is trying to scamper off while madman brock lesnar is uh, busy flinging people like small children and then finally, the heel is slunk off to the entrance way, licking his wounds. And Brock Lesnar, the baby face, has the belt in the ring and is holding it high in the air. And the people are screaming. This segment, maybe not, but the interview, yes. But the fight at the end of this segment had enough energy and chaos and gravitas to it that it would it would look like something from the glory days of raw that austin or rock or taker or mankind or whoever was involved in where people were shitting because you were looking at a riot right in front of you it had an element of that a bit of that which nobody has anymore because everybody's out there fucking throwing phony fucking windmill punches and they don't know how to get fucking vicious heat What'd you think of that particular altercation? I like the stuff earlier with Reigns and Heyman over the belt. Just a little mm -hmm. handing over the belt. I thought that played perfectly into the day before. 
took a while for Lesnar to finally come out. As you correctly pointed out, it was minutes before Reigns even did anything in the ring. <laughs> Luckily, he has enough star power that you'll wait for it. You may fast forward, but you'll want to see what he has to say. Yeah. But it takes forever. And this is a show loaded with commercials and very little wrestling. Lesnar, you know, he's an awkward baby face because everyone knows he's an ass kicker and everyone kind of wants yeah, But to everybody also him. knows he's an asshole. Yeah. I mean, he's a weird baby face in that sense. But I thought this was a great opening segment. I wish the rest of the show matched the energy of the Reigns, Heyman, Lesnar stuff. Well, the only way that's going to happen is if they just let them do the whole two hours. Um, Where do they go with Heyman here? What do you think? You know, it, here's the thing. As we're about to find out, because there's a part two to this, which we'll talk about here in a second. But if Brock Lesnar was on the full-time roster and and he came to, to work more than five or six times a year, then I think they could really draw this out. I mean, they're going to draw it out anyway, obviously. It's just that it's not going to be a weekly thing because they can't afford Lesnar every week. Um, but they could really draw this out. And and they could I, afford him every week if they really wanted to. Well, they can't afford it. But, well, but at the same time, I understand you don't want to make this one guy that's the only guy that's still special. You don't want to make him unspecial. You don't want to do what they've done with Punk and have him wrestling every week on TV. But no, not wrestling, just showing up to talk and or hound Reigns and Heyman's dog their footsteps, make their lives miserable. If Brock was around more often, they should pay him to do that in this instance. But obviously they're not going to because in the next segment, well, we'll go ahead and blow it. He gets suspended indefinitely, which is another way of saying, okay, now he's going to go and we're going to try to keep this warm until WrestleMania. Um, but that's the thing is if, if Brock was going to be around regularly, I would think Heyman, Heyman is an evil genius. He could figure out any innumerable number of twists and turns to keep people guessing, including Reigns and Lesnar guessing as to wh whose side he was going to be on to the point where I could see even <laughs> Lesnar and Reigns both turning to him in a, in a confrontation in the ring and going, before we finish with each other, we're going to settle this right now, you bald-headed, fat-jowled motherfucker. Whose side are you on? I mean, there's all kinds of things, but if Brock ain't going to come play, you know, for a while, I don't know. But in the next segment... Adam Pierce immediately comes out to the ring and condemns Lesnar's actions as he should, mentioning property damage, assaulted officials, uh, damaged, you know, the camera, all the things that you would actually legitimately get in trouble for if they happened. Imagine that. They actually mentioned it. And he said, it's not going to happen on my watch. And he suspends Brock Lesnar indefin indefinitely. And then Brock comes out and Adam's scared as he should be. And Brock's bullshit and has Brock Lesnar has great facials and that, that evil laugh. And he snatched Adam and brow beat him a second and F5 would him to a big pop. And Adam Pierce sold it better than I've seen anybody sell an F5 to this day. He took a great bump from that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and was selling afterwards instead of just laying there unconscious, you could see his face and he had pain on his face and his hand was shaking. And then it got over so good. Th that second one was an ad lib. Brock said, fuck it. I'm doing another one. <laughs> and yet somebody can feel free to, if anybody has the, the scoop on that, feel free to disagree with me, but I'm just telling you that's what happened. And then boom, left Pierce and walked out. But now Brock Lesnar is suspended indefinitely. So where the fuck is this going to go? And then they had the rest of the show. And then finally, I have closing comments on this if you have any, but. It'll be interesting to see where they go. I think it's important to have a strong authority figure, not a heel authority figure. Sonya appears to be more heelish than Pierce. Pierce, from what we've seen, we don't see everything, appears to be more of the by the book backstage official. And I think he's good yeah. in that role. And that bump off the F5, like you said was better than any of the wrestlers take. And I know he's a wrestler, obviously, but... But yeah, but in, in this particular position he's in. 
Okay, well, you mentioned Sonia Deville, our friend Cruella. She's <laughs> in the main event of this, the transfer of belts between Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch was the last segment, and Sonia Deville was in the ring as the emissary from management to oversee this procedure. And the premise of this, Charlotte is the women's champion on whatever. Charlotte's the women's champion of one show. I'm Becky wrong. Lynch is the women's champion of the other show. But now Smackdown. they have been drafted back to, to opposite shows. So basically... They're telling people, okay, since the champion of one show has been drafted to the other one and vice versa, we're just going to have them come in here and switch their belts. And Charlotte's going to hand her belt to Becky and Becky's going to hand her belt to Charlotte. Oh my God, damn it. Two identical belts, by the way, just different colors. I still, I would like anybody to have walked into a room with Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan in it in 1986 and said, hey, I got a great idea. We're going to have two world champions in this company and see which of the two between Vince and Hulk was the first one to throw that stupid sorry sack of gum bumping sack of snake feces out of the fucking locker room. And how can Sonya Deville be doing this? Okay, ladies, now we don't want any trouble. Just switch the belts. We She's a, not only a heel office representative, but she's a heel that was kicking the shit out of one of the girl baby faces on TV last week. But now she has, you can have a heel authority figure when the heel authority figure is making questionable decisions or possibly biased judgments. But when it comes to helping another one of the heels just actively kick the shit out of a baby face member of the roster, Hasn't that triggered some type of firing of that particular authority figure from any responsible company? Does any of this shit make any sense? No, none of it makes any sense okay. at all. So they're going to switch these, trade these identical belts. They don't even have to trade them. They could just change the paint job. They're identical to begin with. They're both women's world champions of something. And the heel authority figure is telling them to switch their belts. And I wouldn't even have watched this thing, except that there was headline news th this morning, the night after this happened, that Charlotte and Becky Lynch had gotten in a, a daggum brouhaha, an argument, a loud discussion, loud noises, um, back in the backstage area after this happened, because Charlotte, apparently, from what PW Insider reported, our friends over there, pwinsider.com. And they usually have their stuff straight. And they, they don't just go off and just say things without reason. Charlotte was worried about the segment making her and her championship reign and or the championship to begin with look weak and wasn't liking the way that it was laid out. But they apparently were going to go and do that anyway. And then... <laughs> Sonya Deville, the, the girls have boo-boo faces at each other. They're not happy about this belt trade, neither one of them, on camera. And Sonya Deville's telling them to do it, so Becky goes to take Charlotte Flair's belt first. And Charlotte does the thing that you do when you're taller than your little sister and you're, you don't want to give it to her. She, like, pulls it away, and Becky has to reach for it. And then Charlotte drops it. And then Becky backs up and you see kind of like a, a smile on her face, almost like, okay, you did it anyway. Maybe this is something they had talked about they were going to do and it got shot down. I don't know. Then Sonya Deville makes Charlotte pick up her own belt. Well, you pick it up. I'm not going to pick it up. Okay, That was something. It up. Her ordering her to pick it up yes. was interesting. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then she picks it up and then she gives it to Sonya Deville and then Becky Lynch just pitches hers kind of like a a low inside fucking pitch at Charlotte and Charlotte grabs it and almost dropped it, but she grabbed it. And then Charlotte asked for what about instead of one of the, what about winner take all tonight? Yay. From the people. But before any answer can be made, here comes Sasha Banks. And she comes out and calls Charlotte Flair, a bitch 
And Charlotte responds with some smart-ass comments, and Becky just says, I'm going to Raw, and pitched her microphone down like she was pissed and <laughs> left the ring. And then Sasha Banks and Charlotte Flair got in an awkward fight, and I wish we could get some Charlotte and Rhea Ripley back because these awkward girls with their girly style do not compliment Charlotte well. Oh, Sasha works good with Charlotte. I wouldn't say nah, that. But, and she did. She gave the, Charlotte the meteora, that double knee thing that I still, I, I don't know how they take it. I don't know how they give it without somebody getting hurt. Off the apron, onto the floor, and then Charlotte powders. Uh, it was a, this was an awkward segment in some ways, but I didn't particularly see any reason to have a, screaming argument about it otherwise than if each one of them was pissed because who didn't do what they said they were going to do ahead of time but it was it sounded better when i heard about the report on pw insider than when we actually saw the segment what'd you think it was a weird segment even beyond the backstage rumors of uh charlotte and becky having problems the whole idea of the segment was weird the whole show this is the end of the show the main event of the show is this Two women standing there to hand the other one the belt. One of them leaves, and then Sasha comes in, and there's a brawl, and they go off the air. And the other weird thing is, I don't know, if, I'm assuming it's like this everywhere. It goes off the air here at 58. So this yes. two minutes, I always feel like, oh, is there going to be anything else? No. Two minutes and then the news. It was awkward. It was weird. Well, and just a little inside television business. The reason that happens is because especially the Fox stations, they want their news to be coming on the air at the stroke of 11 and the network feed gets out of the way so that they can do their local uh, advertising minute window in there and still have time for their top of the hour station ID and go into their news. Hey, do they do this everywhere? Do they do this in Louisville? Here, they've done it my entire life, I think, on Channel 5, which is the Fox affiliate. Well, they'll say, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? Every day. Oh, they don't anymore, but they did years ago. That was um, that was the big thing. I remember when they started that, one of the TV stations in Louisville started it here in the 1970s. It's it, And when we were on, at some points back then, uh, Louisville was on Central Time. When they started monkeying around, one of the energy crises or whatever, they started monkeying around with the time. But whether it was 10 or 11 o'clock, that was the open of the news. It's such and such time. Do you know where your children are? And many people were saying no, and thankfully we could give a shit. I was but, saying yeah, no, and thankfully they didn't watch this show that just ended. Yes. <laughs> Do you know where your children are? Well, if they're watching this show, they're going to need some therapy. Uh, but yes, they they uh, they used to do that, but they don't anymore. Apparently, they don't care about the kids down here as much as they do up there. But a weird, awkward, I guess you say angle, uh, segment, and then whatever happened backstage, it was clear that something broke down, but when I was watching it, I couldn't, I thought they were being playful. I didn't realize that there was any legitimate animosity or problems with it. I bet you that Charlotte pitched something like, I'm not just going to hand my belt, I'll throw it down and she can pick it up or whatever. And no, oh, let's not do that. So then when... She was trying to keep it away from Becky. Maybe she dropped it accidentally, and Becky thought, well, you fucking done it anyway. So I'll do it. I don't, who knows? Who knows? You can't it, say anything as Becky without doing at least a subtle accent. It did the, the accent there, you know, <laughs> like the accent there. Big time Bex. Anyway, so that was SmackDown. What was that? Closing, that, was, that was SmackDown being crumpled up and thrown away. Oh, it's, it didn't sound as noisy as usual. Closing thoughts? That's because I only had one piece of paper because I didn't watch the whole show. Yes, closing thoughts. Not my favorite Friday night for wrestling so far. I didn't really see much in Rampage. I like the women's match in Rampage, and I know you didn't watch it. I know why you didn't. And I can understand why you were turned off from that first match. I like Hobbs. The Andrade Pac... Pac pack match was pretty good and then smackdown is just it's the same thing every week great reigns and Heyman segment if lesnar is in the mix too fantastic the main event women are usually doing good stuff although it almost is always talking and then there's some wrestling tons of commercials interrupting the wrestling and then non-stop backstage segments maybe a nakamura segment with his guitar player you get madcap and fucking baron corbin 
It's the same show every week. I'm about people. to get Mad Cow from Mad Cap. All right. I don't know if there's a cure for that yet. Well, eat more chicken. All right. Are we done here? <laughs> I think so. But of course, the drive through coming at everyone in a few days, and it should be loaded with fun. Loaded with fun. We'll be loaded when we do the drive through That's why it'll be fun. Yeah. WSJ Wines. Yes. Our friends at WSJ. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about whatever they do on Saturday night on AEW. If they don't lead the show with a mascot, in which case I'll turn that thing off too. And uh, we'll have questions, comments, songs, ribald humor, and fun for the whole family. And the That's season the finale track. of Roads to the Top. Oh, shit, I forgot about that. The show that we've all been waiting for, the last one. We'll cover that on the drive through and, and all the other stuff I just talked about. Brian, it's been a privilege and an honor to be sitting here to, with you today doing this program. Really? No, I just wanted to say that as, as some method of close. Uh, actually, what I'd like to say is, boy, I'm glad we're done with this, but thanks everybody for listening, and we'll see you on the drive-thru and next week on The Experience. Thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody!